Last time we left off with discussing the Sabbath and how the Essenes, who were the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, were much stricter on the Sabbath than most other Jews. Now, the problem that we have in the scriptures is that in the Law of Moses, we don't really have a clear list of what constitutes work, what defines Sabbath breaking. This seems very peculiar and strange. When, when we look at scripture, we see that God always seems to be very technical and always goes into the details. And while he often wants us to, him going into such detail in regards to how to keep a Sabbath, which is very strange. So what ended up happening is that the Pharisees, they developed their oral law because the problem is in the law of Moses, it does not address certain things that need to be addressed in order to fully implement the Torah. So the Pharisees, in to fill the holes that we have in, in the scriptures, they added their own understanding and ideas and their traditions to explain how to do the rest of the stuff that the Torah wasn't clear on. However, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we are presented with a different picture. We see and they have copies of the Law of Moses, which are much longer, and they have additional commandments that actually explain all these things, all these holes that, that the Pharisees filled in with their oral law. So the Essenes did not have to, to go to an oral law of the of rabbis or Essene leaders. They All they did was use their version of the Law of Moses because it covered it covered all those holes that that the the oral law tried to cover. And in regards to Sabbath, their law of Moses actually had extra commandments for how to keep the Sabbath. We see this, for example, in the Book of Jubilees. The Essenes considered the Book of Jubilees to be on par with the Torah and in the book of Jubilees, they have a list of commandments of how to keep the Sabbath. What's really striking about this list is that it corresponds exactly with other parts of the Old Testament uh, about how to keep the Sabbath. So for instance, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Nehemiah, and the prophet Jeremiah, they all actually tell us some additional things of how to keep the Sabbath. For instance, Jeremiah talks about uh, burdens, taking up burdens on the Sabbath. And Nehemiah says we're not allowed to buy and sell on the Sabbath. There is no prohibition of buying and selling in the Torah. And yet Nehemiah says it's forbidden. Where did he get this uh, extra commandment? It's in Jubilees, uh, but it's not in our copies of the Law of Moses. It was, however, in the copies of the Essenes in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And similarly, um, Ezekiel and Amos. Amos says, he has a prophecy and he talks about how the Jews were complaining because on the Sabbath, they, they were complaining that they couldn't sell on the Sabbath. They said, when will the Sabbath be over so that we can buy and sell? And they also said, when will the new moon be over so that we can buy and sell? The thing is, there's nowhere in the Law of Moses that we have which uh, which condemns buying and selling or even doing work at all on the new moons. So where did Amos get this idea that we cannot do work on new moons? Ezekiel had the same idea. He associates the the new moon as as a non-working day. But again, the Law of Moses that we have does not say that. But the copies of the Law of Moses that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls actually do explicitly say that. It says that the, the new moon is a no working day. So we have to ask ourselves, with the evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
are the copies of the Law of Moses that we have the original, or are the copies that the Essenes had in the Dead Sea Scrolls the original? And if the copies that the Essenes had are the original, then that has major implications on how we try to live our faith out and how we interpret things and what we come to believe. Because the, the primary difference that they had in their in the Dead Sea Scrolls is this scroll that scholars refer to as the Temple Scroll. The Temple Scroll, when it starts out, it doesn't seem very similar at all to any book of the Torah that we have. But as you progress through and you get into the middle of, of the scroll, you start realizing, wait, this sounds familiar. And then once you read, you see that it's an exact correspondence to the book of Deuteronomy. So they, this temple scroll covers the same information from Deuteronomy chapters 12 all the way to 22. Unfortunately, in the Dead Sea Scroll copy, it wasn't fully preserved because of, of time, fragments. The Dead Sea Scrolls are often very fragmentary because of either bugs or just the time wears away, eats away at the manuscripts. But so in this temple scroll, enough is preserved to show that they had a version of Deuteronomy chapters 12 to 22, which was much longer and is often in a very different order, but it claims to be from God himself in the first person to Moses. So the current book of Deuteronomy that we have is Moses speaking and quoting God in the third person. The Lord says this, or you know, Yahweh says this. But in a Dead Sea Scroll copy, almost always where our copies say Yahweh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls version, it says I instead of Yahweh. It just says I. And that is showing that this is claiming to be from, from God himself. And there are indications in this scroll which cl clearly show that this document in the Dead Sea Scrolls is claiming to be the actual Torah, the, the actual book of Deuteronomy. And it answers so many questions and fills in so many holes. And th there are so many amazing correspondences with other parts of the Old Testament that just cannot be explained without it being the true Torah. I'm just going to give just one example that just, or a couple examples that just are striking. So first of all, as I mentioned, this version of Deuteronomy is in the first person. In, in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was trying to restore the Torah. Ezra and Nehemiah were trying to re restore the Torah to the people. And what's very peculiar is that he quotes, he quotes something from the Law of Moses, which is not in our version. And, but there is something very similar in the book of Leviticus, and, par, and I think part of it is also in Deuteronomy. So there's something similar to what Nehemiah quotes from the law, but he quotes it in the first person, whereas in our version, it's in the third person. So Nehemiah, by his quotation, he is showing us that he had a copy of the law of Moses where parts of it were in the first person. And these parts that were in the first person, in our copies, they're in the third person. So he must have had a different Torah, and this Torah it has striking agreements with what we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So some amazing examples. Nehemiah claims to, he claims to be restoring the law of Moses, and he mentions a, he says that we have to bring the wood offering. There's something called, he called a wood offering, and he says, all the house of Israel have to bring the wood offering at the appointed times, house by house. But we don't see this anywhere in our copies of Torah. But in the Temple Scroll, which claims to be Deuteronomy, the original, we see that there's this festival of the wood offering once a year. It's an annual festival, six days in length. And each, each tribe, house by house, gives it in a specific order. 
And there's so many other pieces of information and evidence that support this being the original version of the book of Deuteronomy. I'm not going to go into all that evidence today. There will hopefully in the future be another seminar for those who are interested in all the evidence for this version of Deuteronomy being the original. There's no, there will be another session where we can go through that together because that deserves a full treatment, but that's not for today. But so this this version of Deuteronomy that they had was foundational to their faith uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes. We, the reason we know this is because, for instance, Jubilees, the book of Jubilees makes claims about, it says this is written in the Torah. Jubilees says that. But many of the things that Jubilees says is written in the Torah are not written in our copies, but they are written in the Temple Scroll version. Similarly, the Essenes had a lot of their own writings that they authored telling their beliefs of different opinions about the law. And almost always their opinions about the law clashed with what the Pharisees said is the case for a bunch of different issues, sacrifice issues, cleanliness issues, and it goes on. There's so many different things that they address which clashes with the Pharisee view of the oral law. But what's striking is that a large number of their opinions that they write in their in their documents are actually explicitly commanded in the Temple Scroll, in their version of the Law of Moses. So if they're right, and this is the original version, it's not them giving their own ideas. They're just appealing to their version of, of the Law of Moses. So, so this shows the correspondence between their writings and a Temple Scroll show that they actually considered this Temple Scroll to be the book of Deuteronomy, the law of Moses. Now, what are the implications if what I'm saying is true? If this is indeed the original, the original book of Deuteronomy, how does that change the, the, the faith of those who are trying to restore Torah and a messianic lifestyle to integrate both the Messiah as well as a Torah observant lifestyle? Well, here are some of the key ways that it, that it would change things. First of all, the debate about, about which calendar to keep would be much more clarified. Basically, the calendar of the Temple Scroll is pretty clearly a solar calendar, and it gives, it gives some new festivals. I mentioned the Woodock Festival. It also gives in our copies of Torah, we are told of a, a feast of, of weeks, Shavuot. In the Temple Scroll, there are actually three Shavuot. There are three feasts of weeks, each uh, separated by 50 days, or each separated by seven weeks. The first one, as we know, is the, is the festival of, of the first fruits of wheat, of new wheat. The second one, which the, the Temple Scroll talks about, is the festival of the first fruits of new wine. So there's new wine. What's really very interesting is that this festival of new wine happens at the exact same time, in, in certain years, it happens at the exact same time that the Pharisees have this special nine days fast. And this nine days fast, they they try to abstain from all wine and, and meat. So it's very interesting of what, of how this came to happen. The Pharisees are fasting from, from specifically from wine and, and meat, whereas the Essenes said, no, this is the festival of wine. We're not supposed to fast from wine. This is actually the festival. So this shows like a calendar clash. And this calendar clash is actually supported by certain uh, apocryphal documents. For instance, in the Apostolic Constitutions, which claims to be written by the Apostles, they have a similar statement of not about the Festival of Wine, but about the Festival of Passover. Basically, they were saying that they basically used it as a calendar, like almost like an in-your-face type thing, where we are 
we're going to be feasting when you're when you're fasting, and when you're fasting, we're going to be feasting. There was this idea of a clash between the calendars. So, is the solar calendar the the true calendar? There are certain passages that some may appeal to to support the lunar calendar. But if what I said is true, that this version of the Book of Deuteronomy is in fact the original, the question is, of these other passages that seem to support a lunar calendar, first of all, are you just reading into it? That's one thing we have to consider. But the second thing is, is it possible that these passages have also slightly been altered by the Pharisees? Because if this version of the Temple Scroll is the original Book of Deuteronomy, that means someone had to alter the Book of Deuteronomy significantly to make the current version that we have, which is more agreeable to the Pharisee standpoint. So what is the evidence for the solar calendar? Do we have any indications? Well, first of all, we have in the book of Genesis, the Essenes, we have a document in the, Essene, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which appeal to Genesis and make the same argument that I'm about to make. Basically, when you look at the chronology in the Dead Sea Scrolls for, uh, excuse me, in, in the book of Genesis, you see that it gives an exact detail of when certain things happened during the year that the flood occurred. We're told that, the, that when, once the rain started and then all the way until the, the, the flood stopped, uh, co covering the earth and then started to go down again, was 150 days. But it gives a date. It, gives, it says it started on the 17th of the second month, and it ended on the 17th of the seventh month. That's 150 days. But that does not agree with a lunar calendar. The calendar is actually less than 150 days. It does not meet the full 150. So that's just one indication right there of our copies uh, of the Torah, Genesis. We also have Jude in the New Testament. If we accept the New Testament, as part of the scriptures of our faith, we have to take into consideration what Jude says. And Jude, he appeals to the book of Enoch as scripture. And in the book of Enoch, we're given a list of commandments of how to keep the calendar, of how to use the calendar. And he actually says in chapter 82 of the book of Enoch that those who use the lunar calendar rather than the solar are actually sinning. So this is just one of the indications where if we are to trust the New Testament and in so doing trust Jude, we have to trust what Enoch says. And Enoch, being a prophet, he's telling us the, how the calendar works. And as I said, it agrees with Genesis and it agrees with the original version of Deuteronomy, uh, the Temple Scroll. So there's a lot more evidence for the calendar as well. Well, I don't want to go too much on that topic for today, but that was just that's just to give an overview. The calendar was crucial to the Essenes, and there are a lot of indications that the Essene calendar was in fact the original. And a lot of their they have a lot of documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls which advocate for this solar calendar. They have their own writings which which emphasize it and they also have a book of the calendar of the priests. It lists the priestly cycles and the priestly cycles correspond exactly with the solar calendar. And they also have uh, they have many other writings that just support this. Writings from King David where King David actually he makes a song for each of the Sabbaths, and the Sabbaths, he gives the date for each Sabbath of the year. And the date he gives corresponds with the solar calendar rather than the lunar. And so that they just have, had so many writings to support their own belief on that. Now, 
One second. Um, what else did this original Book of Deuteronomy have that changes some things? Well, it had it had laws about the temple. That's why it's called the Temple Scroll. You see in the Book of Ezekiel, out of nowhere, Ezekiel comes up with all these laws of how to build how to build a temple. Well, for who's Ezekiel? Where, what authority does he have? How is he coming with all these new commandments? And when you actually compare his commandments in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48, some of them appear to completely disagree and contradict what we have in the Law of Moses. For instance, like how many sacrifices you are to give at each festival. The, the list of offerings in Ezekiel does not agree with the list of offerings in the Book of Numbers, for instance. So is Ezekiel a contradiction or is he adding new commandments out of nowhere, uh, or as the, as the evidence seems to support, he actually was, he, these extra commandments for the temple, he wasn't making these up, but these were actually original commandments that were once in the law of Moses. And so he was, as a prophet, trying to turn the people back to the Torah. He was not making his own Torah for the people to follow, but he wanted to bring them back to Torah. So the fact that he was trying to bring them back to Torah and not to give them a new Torah is a strong indication that that the Torah that he was trying to bring them back to actually had laws of the temple, how to build it, the sacrifices to do in it. And if that's the case, then Ezekiel must have had the temple scroll or something very similar to it as his book of Deuteronomy. And this temple scroll Book of Deuteronomy also has more information about uncleanness. What makes you unclean? How to, what happens, for instance, the Torah doesn't really address it too much, but what happens if after, if you fail to clean yourself, what happens? Do you just remain clean, unclean, or is there, do you eventually become, do you, do you eventually become clean after several weeks or something? Or do you just remain perpetually unclean? Well, this fuller version of Deuteronomy seeks to address some of these other issues of uncleanness more clearly. So that's just kind of an overview of some of what they had for their Torah. Now, some people, there's this phrase that's used in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's called the works of the law. Some people reject you see, they use this phrase, works of the law, in their writings about, as I mentioned earlier, some of their own opinions about extra commandments. But as I said, these, their opinions are actually almost exact quotations from their version of the law of Moses. But so they refer to their judgments on this as the works of the law. Now, some people who have been trying to restore the Nazarene faith have come to the conclusion that when Paul mentions the phrase works of the law, he's not talking about the law of Moses, but he's talking about the extra commandments of the Essenes. The problem with this idea is, first of all, the context of what Paul says. When you look at what Paul says, it's pretty clear that he's talking about the actual law of Moses. In, in, in Paul's view, we are not saved or we are not justified by the works of the law, he, the law of Moses, not the works of the law of, that are not valid, his entire argument is about the actual law of Moses. It's pretty clear when you just read his writings for what for what they say. But so, taking that into account, we also have to consider what the Essenes believed the works of the law to be. And it's clear from the Essene writings as well that, as I said, since it's they were just uh, their opinions were exact correspondence to their version of the law, their works of the law were just the works of the Law of Moses as they believed the Law of Moses to be. But what also defeats this argument that some people make is that the Essenes have a writing in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which they had many copies of, so it showed that they, they accepted it as authoritative. This was a writing claimed, claiming to be by David, extra psalms that he did. And in one of these psalms, he says this, he says, Only by your goodness shall a man be justified, purified by the abundance of your compassion. So here we have a psalm attributed to David by the Essenes, 
who taught the works of the law, that only by your goodness shall man be justified. This kind of seems to agree with what, with what Paul was saying. By the works of the law, a man will be justified and be justified by faith. Because it, as this psalm says, only by your goodness. So only by faith in him shall we be saved, not by our works. That's what Paul and this psalm are seeming to say. And yet, what does Paul say somewhere else? He says in Romans, he says, it is not the hearers of the law who will be justified, but it is the doers of the law who will be justified. So notice he's actually saying in order to be justified, you have to do the law. You have to be doers of the law. But it is not the law itself which justifies doers of the law. It is their faith in the Messiah which justifies doers of the law. And that's what the Essenes believed, because the Essenes were obviously, they, they believed in the Torah observance and works of the law. One second. Okay. Uh, so that's just a connection right there, because the phrase works of the law is very peculiar, and we don't really see this anywhere else in ancient writings, but we see this both in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in Paul's letters. So this kind of shows that the the community that he was writing to, the churches he was writing to, had an understanding of this phrase, works of the law. And the Essenes used this term. So this might be an indication that the early Messianics at that time were Essenes or had Essene influence in their midst, for they understood what this phrase was referring to, works of the law. I'm going to, I'm going to read some interesting messianic prophecies that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, just to sort of give some of their Essene perspective of some of what, of what was going to be attributed to the Messiah. First of all, in this, as I mentioned, this, this psalm that was attributed to David, there were other psalms in that same scroll that were attributed to David, and this one is very striking. And you, anyone who's familiar with the Gospels, we'll be able to see the striking similarity. So I read, uh, scholars call this hymn 16, but it probably was not the 16th hymn in the scroll, it's just what scholars call it. Call it. So it reads, Their works are deceitful, for good works were rejected by them. Neither did they esteem me, even when you displayed your might through me. Instead they drove me out from my land as a bird from its nest. And all my friends and acquaintances have been driven away from me. They esteem me as a ruined vessel, but they are mediators of a lie and seers of deceit. They have plotted wickedness against me so as to exchange your law, which you have spoke distinctly in my heart, for flattering words directed to your people. They hold back the drink of knowledge from those who thirst. And for their thirst, they give them vinegar to drink, that they might observe their error, behaving madly at their festivals and getting caught in their nets. What's striking about this is the mention of the vinegar, giving the vinegar to drink, and they're doing this during their festivals. And what happened with the Messiah, they did the same thing. During their festival of Passover, they offered the vinegar vinegar to him, and at the same time, all his friends and acquaintances were driven away from him. And they esteemed him as a ruined vessel. And so, that's just a connection right there. So many prophecies, or excuse me, so many of the Psalms of David in our Bibles are believed by people to be prophecies of the Messiah. But originally, David was not talking about the Messiah often. He was actually talking about his own experiences. So for instance, it's either Psalm 22 or Psalm 23, can't remember which, or maybe both. It talks about uh, his own experiences and it talks about him being pierced in his hands or something. Well, when that psalm was originally written, it was actually David pouring out his heart. He didn't, he, it seems that he did not have the Messiah in mind when he composed that psalm. But nevertheless, that psalm is strikingly a picture of the Messiah. These psalms that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls are believed by many scholars to be written, composed by someone call, they call the teacher of righteousness. There's a character in the Dead Sea Scrolls referred to 
as the teacher of righteousness. He seems to have messianic components. So what's striking is that these psalms are being attributed by scholars to the teacher of righteousness or to, to the Essene Messiah. But the evidence seems the best support that they were actually originally attributed to David. And yet these, these psalms attributed to David are also being attributed to the Messiah without the scholars realizing the connections. It supports the idea that these psalms were actually written by David. There's a lot of Davidic style of the authorship and themes, so many connections. There are two other prophecies that I would like to read that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which have striking agreements with the Messiah of the New Testament. And these prophecies have no, they don't really have any parallels in the rabbinic literature or the Pharisees literature. So I'm going to read, read these. One scroll says this, it's from a, an unknown prophecy, an, an unknown prophet. Great will he be called and he will be designated by his name. He will be called Son of God, and they will call him Son of the Most High. Like the sparks that you saw, so will their kingdom be. They will rule several years over the earth and crush everything. A people will crush another people, and a province another province, until the people of God arises and makes everyone rest from the sword. His kingdom will be an eternal kingdom, and all his paths in truth. He will judge the earth in truth, and all will make peace. The sword will cease from the earth, and all the provinces will pay him homage. The great God is his strength, and he will wage war for him. He will place the peoples in his hand and cast them away before him. His rule will be an eternal rule. That was one prophecy, and that's just striking because it uses the term son of God, which is a very controversial messianic designation, and we don't see that term anywhere in the Old Testament. And yet the New Testament uses it as if it was well known already. So we have these other writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls which are using these unknown terms. And it just is a correspondence, it's a support of what we're seeing in the New Testament. Another quotation from the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Messiah is this. For the heavens and the earth will listen to his anointed one, and all that is in them will not turn away from the precepts of the holy ones. Strengthen yourselves, you who are seeking the Lord in his service. Will you not in this encounter the Lord all those who hope in their heart? For the Lord will consider the pious and call the righteous by name. And his spirit will hover upon the poor, and he will renew the faithful with his strength. For he will honor the pious upon the throne of an eternal kingdom, freeing prisoners, giving sight to the blind, straightening out the twisted. And forever shall I cling to those who hope and in his mercy. And then part of the fragment is missing. And then it continues. And the Lord will perform marvelous acts such as have not existed, just as he said, for he will heal the badly wounded and will make the dead live. He will proclaim good news to the poor. And a little bit later, and enrich the hungry. This language is just strikingly similar to what well, is attributed to him in the Gospels. And this, this language is very rare in the Old Testament. We see, we see this primarily in the book of Isaiah, but I'm not sure if it mentions resurrecting from the dead or not. But this is a clear reference to the Messiah raising people from the dead when he comes and preaching the gospel or the good news to the poor and the hungry. He will enrich the hungry. All these messianic characteristics are being attributed to, to the Messiah as well as to Yeshua in the New Testament. So the Dead Sea Scrolls we're coming to find with so much study and research is that it supports more and more the faith of the New Testament, of the Yeshua as the Messiah who was prophesied to come. Now, here is a very controversial thing that I want to address because it's foundational and crucial to the Essenes and what they believed and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Basically, as I mentioned, in their version of the Book of Deuteronomy, it's much different, has different laws. Well, they actually have a in chapter in the part of Deuteronomy that corresponds with our chapter 17, they have an additional section 
which is called the Law of the King. Now, in this Law of the King, it gives a list of laws that the king is required to obey. In our copies, the only laws that he's required to obey are do not multiply wives, horses, and do not greatly multiply gold and silver. That's all that's attributed to him in our copies. But in, the, in, in their version of Deuteronomy, it gives a much longer list of what the king is required to do. Now, this extra section, is, as I said, it's called the Law of the King or the Book of the Kingdom. In First and Second Samuel, Samuel actually refers to some type of book for the king. And this book that Samuel writes for the king is striking agreement with what we have in the scroll. So it's very clear, based on the connection there, that either the author of the Temple Scroll saw what first Samuel said and said, okay, I'm going to write a law for the king using Samuel as a source for my inspiration. Or the other option is that the author of first Samuel and Samuel himself, because this is a record of what Samuel did and said, Samuel was using the actual law of Moses because the law of Moses commanded him to do this, to write this book of the king for the king that was being ordained, a list of laws he was supposed to do. So this list of laws that Samuel says the king has to do is in striking agreement with what the temple scroll says. And Samuel appeals to the same chapter uh, of Deuteronomy as, as the temple scroll is appealing to. So this is a further connection here. But so in this in this section of the king, the law for the king, there is a passage which isn't easy for people to accept, some, pe some people to accept, and it says that the king is required by law to have one wife only. He is not allowed to marry more than one woman, and this wife that he has, he has to keep her his whole life, and once she dies, then he's allowed to remarry an, an, another woman, but the woman he remarries has to be someone from his own tribe. Or in other words, it has, to be, uh, it has to be someone from Israel. It can't be a foreigner. So if this is indeed the original version of Deuteronomy, how does this correspond with, for instance, King David? King David, we, we know, had multiple wives, but he was called a man after God's own heart. So how does this reconcile? How, how do the Essenes reconcile this, at least? Well, first of all, for the Essenes and for most people, if the law of Moses says it, it doesn't matter if another passage disagrees, because the law of Moses is, is supposed to be our foundation. So if the law of Moses says that, that a king is not allowed to have more than one wife, it doesn't matter if David or other people did and were, were justified. It doesn't matter the reasons, because if the law of Moses says it, we need to, we need to follow it and abide by it. But the, the Essenes had an understanding of why this was the case. How they, they reconciled it. I'm going to read from one of their books a passage which addresses this issue. So it says, it, this is from their book that they wrote called Damascus Documents. That's what scholars refer to it as. And it reads, the walls shall have been built, the boundary been far removed, and during all these years, Belial shall be let loose against Israel, as God spake through Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, saying, Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitants of the land. This means the three nets of Belial, concerning which Levi, the son of Jacob, spake, by which he caught Israel and directed their faces to three kinds of, of righteousness. The first is fornication. The second is the wealth. The third is the pollution of the sanctuary. He that cometh up from this shall be caught by that, and he that escapeth from this shall be caught by that. The builders of the wall, who walk after law, the law it is which talks, of which he said, assuredly, they shall talk, are caught by two, by fornication, in taking two wives during their lifetime. But the fundamental principle of the creation, male and female, created he them. And they who went into the ark, 
two and two went into the ark. And as to the prince, it is written, he shall not multiply wives unto himself. But David read not in the book of the law that was sealed, which was in the ark. For it was not opened in Israel from the day of the death of Eliezer and Joshua and the elders who served Ashtaroth. And the public copy was hidden until Zadok arose. Now they glorified the deeds of David, except only the blood of Uriah. And God forgave him that. And they also pollute the sanctuary, since they separate not according to the law, and lie with her who sees the blood of her issue. And they take each his brother's daughter, or his sister's daughter. But Moses said, Thou shalt not approach thy mother's sister. She is thy mother's near kin. So the law of intercourse for males is written, and the same law holds for females. And let not the daughter of the brother uncover the nakedness of the brother of her father. He is near of kin. So this passage, to basically explain what they're saying, is polygamy is, is wrong. It's against the law. But David did not have access to the law. He did not have a way of knowing the law because it was sealed from the people. The priests uh, of the temple had access to it, but the regular people did not until it says Zadok arose and then he re released it to the people. Now, either the Essenes are making this up out of nowhere, or they had extra books, extra ap apocryphal books, which, ex which claimed these things. Because they give the detail, they said it wasn't revealed until Zadok came. But this is nowhere stated in our copies. So either their copies of scriptures actually said this, that Zadok released the law to the people, or they just reasoned it and assumed but it is my belief that they did not just make it up, but that they actually had extra books which actually claimed this. And as I said, their version of the law explicitly condemns what David did as a sin against the, against the law. But so their argument is that he wasn't able to know the, the requirement. And so because he was not able to know, God overlooked that as a sin of ignorance. Now the law of Moses talks about sins of ignorance that can be atoned for, by, by sin offerings and things of that nature. These sins of ignorance are, he, are overlooked by God because the people don't have a way of knowing it's wrong. So David, because he did not have a way of knowing about this requirement, he was not considered guilty or wicked for it. He was considered a man after God's own heart. So if this is the case, that ignorance and inability to know is a justification of not being considered wicked, then this reconciles and we do not have to we do not have to dismiss this copy of Torah, even though all the evidence supports it. We can accept the Torah that the Dead Sea Scrolls shows us for what it is. And we can reconcile it by saying, okay, David was in innocent ignorance. But what about people today who teach, who teach polygamy is okay in the, in the Messianic movement? Well, the problem is, according to the Essenes, all you need is the book of Genesis. Because in the book of Genesis, it says, they, they appeal to Genesis as proof. They appeal to, in the beginning, God created them male and female. And he made them in the image of God, or the image of Elohim. Now, what is Elohim according to the scriptures? We see Elohim is the father and the Holy Spirit. And in ancient writings and in Hebrew, the art, the Holy Spirit, that's a feminine conception. And so the scriptures seem to paint a, the Holy Spirit as the mother. So the father and the mother, and then there's the son, which is the Messiah. So the father and the mother, the image of Elohim is the one male and the one female, or in other words, the father and the Holy Spirit. There is not the Holy Spirit and other women, other females that are part of his, of his number of, of wives. He only has one wife, in, in a sense of wife, because he's not actually married to the Holy Spirit, but it's an image. So his wife, the Holy Spirit, that's only one. That's a monogamous relationship. And humans were made in the image of, of Elohim. So we are, 
for that reason, men are only allowed to have one wife because otherwise they are they are going against the image. They are they are putting to shame the image of Elohim. That's what the Essenes believed. So if the Essenes are right, then all we need is Genesis to know that this is true. And is there other evidence to support this? In Leviticus, we're told that it is a sin to, to take the sister of your wife. Now, the Pharisees try to translate it in a way, or to inter and understand it in the way of, you're not supposed to marry the, the sister of your wife, but it's possible, and the Essenes believe this, and the Samaritans also had it in their copies of, this, of the Torah. Their version kind of supports more the Essene view. And so it can either be interpreted as the Pharisees are interpreting it, or it can mean do not, have, do not take a sister wife. The term sister wife is a common term used by polygamous type of thinking to refer to a, an extra wife alongside who is like a sister. She's my sister wife. So the, the Torah, Leviticus, can actually be understood as condemning having a sister wife. In other words, condemning polygamy. This interpretation seems to be best supported by the evidence because the Septuagint is very similar to the, the, the Masoretic version of Deuteronomy. But there's one key difference. There's a list of curses in chapter 27, I think it is, or 26 of Deuteronomy. Cursed be so-and-so. Cursed be the man who sleeps with his father's wife or something like that. And it keeps going through a list of cursed be this person who sleeps with so-and-so. In the Septuagint, there's an extra little curse that's not in, the, in the, the Pharisee version of most people's Bibles. This extra curse is, cursed is he who sleeps with the sister of his wife, or who takes a sister wife. But this curse is not in most people's Bibles, because it's only in the Septuagint version. But so did the Septuagint writers add this curse, or did the Pharisees remove this curse? Why would, why would uh, the Septuagint writers add this curse? For what reason would they add it? It seems, the evidence seems to support that the Pharisees saw this curse and they didn't like the implications of this because it seemed too close to, to be cursing them. So they actually removed it, it seems, from their copies uh, so that people wouldn't take it the wrong way, or as the Essenes believe, the right way. So there's a lot of indications that the that polygamy is, according to the original Torah, is in fact wrong. But what about Abraham? Did Abraham violate this? According to the Essene understanding and the Torah of the Essenes, taking a concubine is not always wrong. It's not always polygamy. Because a concubine is actually, what it is, is a surrogate wife. A surrogate wife is a wife who has a child in the place of a woman. And in the original understanding of Torah, it was in the place of a woman who could not have her own child. So it was a surrogate wife is who, for someone who was barren. So we see that Sarah was barren. And so she told her husband, Abram, use this woman as my surrogate. She's my replacement or my representative. Her child that you have through her will be as it, through me. So this understanding of concubine was was not a second wife or a secondary wife, but as a substitute, a temporary substitute for barren woman. And we see this all throughout. We see, for instance, in I think it's First Samuel, we see Samuel's Samuel's mother was in a similar situation. There was a, there was a, bar there was barrenness involved. Now, what about Jacob? It's possible that Jacob was, was in the wrong uh, and sinning, but in the case, as I said, in the case of David, he would be, in the Essene understanding, he would be innocent because of inability to know. 
But there's a different understanding which uses similar, similar logic. But they, they believe that basically Jacob did not consider himself as being married to two different women. He basically considered only one to be his wife, Rachel, and Leah, he treated her like a concubine. He did not treat her like his actual wife. Well, is there some evidence for this? First of all, he, when, when, she, when she wanted a child, she had to go to Rachel and ask for permission. She said she, she had to buy the, or she had to sell the, the mandrakes, or whatever. So to get him to sleep with Jacob. Anyone who knows a man or anyone who, yeah, basically anyone who knows how a man thinks, if they know that a man believes that he can sleep with multiple women, then he will. He will want to do that. So if Jacob thought he could just sleep with both of them whenever he wanted because he was married to them both, then why did she go through all that trouble to, like, to go to Rachel? Why didn't she go to Jacob and say, okay, I want to sleep with you. Can we do that? And then he would have said, okay, we'll do that. Any man would have done that, essentially, because Leah was not an old woman. She wasn't as attractive as Rachel, but she was still she was still a young woman, and he slept with her before and had no issue with it. So he would have, like any other man, would have not had an issue with it. Um, just If she had just asked him. But for, for her... She felt she needed to ask Rachel. And the extra books of the Apocrypha, which the Essenes accepted, actually give us further information about this. The Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. The, there were some of these Testaments in the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found. And these are writings claiming to be by the Twelve Sons of Jacob on their deathbed, giving the last words of instruction to their children. And there's a Testament of Levi. Uh, excuse me, not Levi. There's a Testament of Issachar. Issachar was the son who was born of this little event that we, I just referred to, of the selling of the mandrakes. And what, did he, what he says in his testament is that his mother, Rachel, accused Leah. Basically, what he says, Rachel said, was, you're not married to Jacob. You're not his wife. I'm his wife. So there was this clash of Rachel saying, you're not his wife. So we know Jacob had a, an unfair attachment to Rachel, and he kind of sided with her. So if this was actually what Rachel said, he would have sided with her. And in Jacob's understanding, because it was deception, he married Leah in deception. He thought, okay, it wasn't an actual marriage, because I, I didn't realize that's who she was. I thought she was someone else. But in God's eyes, it doesn't matter if you thought she was someone else. You married her. So she was actually his true wife, but he did not realize that. So he did actually have two wives, but he didn't think he had two wives. And he was, like David, he was overlooked for that. He, God did not hold him to account of that because there was no, there was no book or way of Jacob knowing that that was wrong. So that's the seen perspective of, of what happened with Jacob. Now, for people who are still not convinced, who may be listening, there's also this we have to take into consideration. Was the Messiah in a scene? If he was in a scene, his version of Torah would have condemned polygamy. Now, when we read Messiah's arguments and statements, without trying to make his words support what our preconceptions are, it seems that he clearly believes that monogamy is the thing we have to abide by. I'm just going to go through, just read one passage from the New Testament on, on this, just to kind of show it seems, in, without trying to make it fit, it seems to support this. So this is from Matthew chapter 19. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea, beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he, headed, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? 
And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for fornication and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only to whom it has been given. And he, one second. So, and he who is able to accept it, let him accept it. So, so to just summarize this in my own words here. So the Pharisees, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Messiah, no, it is not. Because the Torah says in Genesis, male and female, he created them. And when they become married, they join together and become one flesh. So what God has joined together, no man, let no man separate it. So why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce if divorce is not allowed? Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses permitted it. But in the beginning, it was not so. Whoever divorces his wife except for fornication and he marries someone else, he commits adultery. And if his wife that he divorced marries someone else, the man she married has committed adultery with her. So the disciples, if that's true, it's better not to marry. And as Messiah said, not everyone can accept this teaching. So when you read it naturally without trying to make it fit, the preconceived idea that he was a supporter of polygamy, he seems to support this because, uh, support the monogamy view of the Essenes because he says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. The problem is if polygamy is not adultery, then what Messiah says here is in fact not true. If he divorced his wife wrongly, he could still marry someone else. It would not be adultery to, for him to marry a second woman, even if his first wife was divorced, because he could remarry the first woman afterwards and make it up to her. There would be marrying a second woman would not make him unable to reconcile with his first wife if polygamy was okay. But according to the Messiah, if you divorce your first wife and then marry a different woman, you're committing adultery. He, he says that in Matthew chapter 19. And then he says in the next line, and if your wife that you divorced is married to another man afterwards, the man commits adultery with her as well. So it seems here that Messiah is agreeing with the Essenes. And if he did, then he must have had a different Torah, which had that understanding. And Paul seems to support this too when he says, for instance, the bishop and the, and the elder is to be the husband of one wife. This seems to support the idea that of the original Deuteronomy that a leader or a king of the people is only to have one woman. This seems to support that idea. So Paul, perhaps, or the people he was writing to, had this version of Deuteronomy that said a leader was only allowed to have one wife. And there's a lot of apocrypha claiming to be written by the apostles and even Messiah himself sometimes, and the apostles, if these documents were written by the apostles, that is, then they clearly taught in explicit terms that polygamy is a sin. So there's a lot of evidence, it seems, that the Essene view is the, was the actual original view of the law of Moses. So that's anyway, that, that's the Essene perspective right? and the Dead Sea Scroll perspective on the issue of polygamy. Um, so let me see one second here. Okay, so there were three items given to the Essenes when they were going through their conversion process. There was a robe, uh, a white robe, that is, uh, a linen girdle, and there was a special rake. I mentioned the white garment in the, the other session, and that was just used for hor for holy functions. Whenever they were doing a holy thing, they wore those white gowns. 
But what was the rake for? I did not mention it too much in the other session. I'm going to mention it in this one because it actually has a very strong importance and value to these people, these scenes. And what it was is that in the book of Deuteronomy, in both our copies and the original one, it actually mentions a special rake. And this rake was to be used for going to the bathroom outside of the city where you would dig up the dirt and bury, bury your waste products. What this special shovel rake that they gave to the converts signified was this, that you were going to sacrifice convenience and you were going to, to live a holy life because the, their community, being separated from all others, they could, they could fully obey and implement the, cleanness, the cleanliness laws. So basically what happened, we're told by Josephus, who actually was considering possibly becoming an Essene, he writes in the first century AD about the Essene ideas. And he says that the Essenes did not go to the bathroom on the Sabbath. Why did, not, why did they not do this? The reason they did not do this is because, well, first of all, they trained their bodies not to. So it wasn't like something overbearing for them because their bodies were adapted to it. It was an easy. It was easy for them because that was their way of life. It was, it was. They could easily not go to the bathroom on the Sabbath. But the reason why is because the Torah actually commands in the original. It commands us not to leave our city or place of living more than two thousand cubits. Uh, and also, we're not allowed to dig. We're not allowed to dig on the Sabbath. So to dig up the dirt with your little rake would be doing work because the we're not allowed to dig for that for those reasons. It's not something the Torah ever allows, even for priests. So the understanding of this rake was you're going to live by these extreme laws because you can. For for me, I don't use a rake because I can't. I don't have a way of doing that. There is no way of safely doing that in the place I'm living because of if I were to try to do that, it would actually be harming other people. So the best way for, for me to, to, to eliminate the uncleanness is to just as people normally do, go to the bathroom through, through the regular way of, because we have our technology. But in a special society which has the ability to obey God's commandments fully, then we need to do this as what the Essenes were trying to do. So, for instance, the sacrifices. We cannot do the sacrifices ourselves. But once we're able to, then by ourselves separating from the rest of the world and doing the sacrifices, that is a test of commitment and, and sacrifice. So, similarly, similarly, this was the test of, a test of faith. If you're going to be a true Essene, then you're going to sell out and you're going to be com completely, completely holy. So that was the significance. As I mentioned in the previous session, the previous seminar, is that when the Messiah taught about the Sabbath, he did not actually teach that it was okay to break the Sabbath for the sake of saving people's lives. He actually taught that is, like basically some of the Pharisees were teaching that healing is always wrong, even on the Sabbath. But the Messiah's view was that healing itself is not an issue. As long as healing does not break the Sabbath, it's, it's fine to heal people. But the Pharisees were teaching all healing is wrong. But so the Messiah was correcting that view and saying, when he said the Sabbath was made, the, uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, he was actually saying that the Sabbath was made uh, because men need the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for men because the men need the Sabbath. Men were not made for the Sabbath because the Sabbath does not need men. The Sabbath is above men. But we need the Sabbath. So because we need it, the whole idea of the Sabbath being contrary to our, our well-being doesn't make sense. So the whole idea that we can't heal on the Sabbath is ridiculous because that would mean, that would be like a contrary to what the Sabbath's purpose is, is for. And the Sabbath's purpose is for our well-being. The Sabbath is for what we need. And so in the, in the Ten Commandments, we see a list of 
in order of certain commandments. And it seems, it may just be a theory, but there's, a, there's some evidence to support the idea that the Ten Commandments, the order they're listed in, is actually an indication of how important they are. So if that's the case, then Sabbath is more important than the command to honor your parents and to not kill people and to not commit adultery. That would be hard for some people to accept because it's murder and adultery just seems so wrong. It just seems so much more wrong naturally. Um, we don't really view Sabbath as, oh, that's not as a big deal. If someone breaks the Sabbath, it's like, oh, okay, he broke the Sabbath, whatever. But in the Essene understanding, it's a serious blasphemy and crime to break the Sabbath, worse than murder, worse than adultery, worse than dishonoring your parents. It's, it's actually a sin against God himself. So when, you know, Messiah says there's two commandments and the greater commandment is to love God with all your heart, breaking the Sabbath is actually a, a sin against God. And that, a sin against God is actually worse than a sin against our fellow man. So in the same understanding, the Sabbath is really holy and we need to respect it. And if we're, people who break the Sabbath are, are doing a really heinous crime, but we are trying to reach out to these people and bring them to the truth. So we don't, I don't go around bashing people because it's not going to encourage them to come to the truth of what I, of what I believe the truth that is. So, but, so that's the same understanding of the Sabbath is so holy. And it's so holy, if you pick up sticks on the Sabbath, you deserve to die. That's what we see in the book of Numbers. Of someone picked up sticks and they said, what should we do? And Moses asked God, what do we do? And he, God said, kill him, stone him. And so they stoned him. And that's, that's in the book of Numbers, but that just shows God took it seriously. And he wanted us to take it seriously. Uh, so... And there are some Jews, I don't believe this personally, and I don't think it's, I don't encourage anyone to believe this, but it's just to show you some, how some Jews thought differently. Some Jews actually believe that the Sabbath was an actual creature, a living being that we were supposed to respect and honor, like basically like an angel almost, and who was alive. But it's just sort of to show that the Sabbath is kind of not being really well respected in our society. There's a lot of shortcuts and loopholes being taken by people. So the Essenes are very strict uh, about the Sabbath and emphasize keeping it holy. That's a very important part of their faith. And so a contrast with the Essenes and the Pharisees was that they believed it is better to, it is better to die than to even break one of the commandments, even the smallest commandment. So you know the commandment to wear little tassels of fringes on your garment. In the Essene view, you better wear that. And if you don't, you, you, you better wear that, and if someone says, wear that or I'll kill you, you wear it, and if they kill you, that's what you got to do to obey God. The basic premise is in Deuteronomy 30, we're told, if you want life, obey the commandments, and if you want death, disobey the commandments. And we, it seems, take that very seriously, that the law is our life. Obeying the law, commandments, in faith, obeying the law is our life. So to disobey the law for our life, doesn't make sense for us, it seems. We don't, it doesn't make sense because we are told the law is our life. So we obey, just like when in the book of Daniel, they said, uh, when they were being thrown into the fire, God could save us if he wants to, but even if he doesn't, we will, we refuse to bow down to you, to your, to your idol. And then God did end up saving them, but they were right. He could have chosen not to save them. And so what, uh, if he didn't save them, that doesn't matter because the more important thing is obeying God's commandments. The more important thing is God and obeying him. The more important thing is God being honored rather than us being honored. So when we sell ourselves out completely to him and live our lives all about him, it doesn't matter if we live or die. So, so, so like, you know what, what Paul was saying, whether we live or die, you know, is gain. You know, if he dies, it's gain. If he lives, it's, it's good too. He was basically saying everything is for, for Christ or everything is for Elohim. So that's the Essene perspective. I just want to mention some things I want to discuss for next time for people who are interested. Uh, first of all, my intention here, and we can change this if, if Jackson wants to change this um, or if people want to have a different setup. 
I'm thinking of primarily seven seminars to cover adequately this information uh, of what I would like to share with you all. And this is number three, so I would like to do four more at least, and then from that point on, if people want to do more, we can always do more, and if not, I will have presented what I believe is important for all you to hear. But in the next session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss more of the theology of what they believed and a little bit more of, of who the Essenes were. And after that, either in the same session or the, the, the session after that, what I'm going to discuss is basically after next session, you will have understood the basically the Essene faith and religion according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and Josephus. But then what I'm going to try to show is, okay, now that you know what the Essenes believed and taught, here's the evidence that the apostles and Messiah were the Essenes and they, they taught and believed the same exact things. I'm going to go through each of these things that I've presented to you and other things that I have not shared yet. I'm just going to show the overwhelming evidence that they are the same, that the Messiah wasn't a scene, and that the Nazarene religion was actually, in all its particulars, an Essene religion. And the final seminar that I would like to present to you all is basically going through the extra books, the Apocrypha, and showing the evidence that the Messiah and the Apostles accepted the pretty much all the Apocrypha as scripture. So that's kind of the overview of what I'd like to share with you in the future. Thank you all for, for listening to this one, and I hope you stay tuned and come back next week. Shalom. Great. Thank you, brother. Thank, Great. Thank, thank you, you so you much. Brother. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you all again for coming. Next week we'll take thank a Thank you. Shalom. Thank you. I'm going to be discussing primarily theology, eschatology, and messianic understanding of the Essenes and Dead Sea Scrolls. And I'll be offering... I will be offering uh, connections with the New Testament. I want to start out by talking about the understanding of the Messiah. In their writings, they refer to the Messiah of Aaron and Israel. Now, this is a peculiar designation for, for who the Messiah is. What do they mean by this phrase? The Messiah of Aaron and Israel. Well, first of all, we know Aaron was the priest, the high priest. And Israel was associated with the kingdom of Israel. So the Messiah of Aaron and Israel was the Essene way of saying the priest, the Messiah who would be priest and king. Now, as I've mentioned in other seminars, one of their foundational texts that they accepted as scripture is the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. And all throughout the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, they refer to the Messiah as coming from both the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah. And the tribe of Levi designation was linked to the priesthood, whereas the tribe of Judah designation was linked to the kingdom. Now this does not seem to agree with the idea that these passages are interpolations scholars who assess the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, they think a lot of passages which seem to be prophecies of the Messiah of the New Testament were added by scribes or was written by a Christian writer. But the problem is it was almost a universal belief of Christians that the Messiah was not from the tribe of Levi. But so we have these saying that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Levi for the priesthood and the tribe of Judah for the kingdom. So this supports the idea that these are not actually Christian writings after the fact, but that these are actually uh, Essene writings that the Essenes accepted prior to Christianity beginning. Because this understanding of the priestly and king messiah was foundational to the Dead Sea Scroll writers. So they believed that eventually the Messiah of Aaron and Israel would come and 
he would atone for the people and he would rule over them as king and fight war for the world and gain peace for the world. Now, there's a, I've mentioned in the other seminars this text that they wrote, the Essenes wrote, that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's called the Damascus Document. In the Damascus Document, it gives it gives some details about the coming of a teacher of righteousness. And the details it gives, it, it purports to give the, the exact years of when he would come. It says, after the Babylonian exile, there would be 390 years and then another 20 years, and then the, the teacher of righteousness would come. Now, a lot of scholars have been trying to understand what exactly are they referring to. The problem is these, these dates, so 390 years plus 20 years, that's 410 in all, does not, it doesn't seem to match any historical figure that we're aware of. When you start counting from when the exile began, when you start counting from when the exile began, the, the 410 years does not match any significant historical figure that we are aware of. However, if you take it to mean when they recovered from the Babylonian exile, because in the Damascus document, it, it's a little bit ambiguous as the, as the exact reference, but basically it says after the Babylonian exile. So when did the Babylon, Babylonian exile entirely end? Did it end after the 70 years or did it end when the temple was finally built, the second temple? If we go with the interpretation that it ended with the second temple being built, as we're told in Ezra and Nehemiah and in the Gospel of John, it took 46 years to build the temple, the second temple. When you go from that date of when the second temple was finished, add 390 years, and then you add another 20 years, you get the exact year within one or two years, depending because people don't know exactly when Yeshua was born. But when you do that, you add 390 years from when the temple, the temple was finished, and then you add 20 years after that, and you get the exact year when Yeshua was born. So in my view, this seems the best support that this was actually a prophecy of the Messiah of the New Testament. Now, the Essenes consider themselves to be prophets, and their, their ability to prophesy was so convincing that it convinced Jews from other denominations, like Josephus. He was, con he was convinced that they were legitimate prophets, and yet Josephus said that the Pharisees didn't no longer have the gift of prophecy. So he says that the, the Essenes still had the gift of prophecy during the Second Temple era. Uh, and he also, Josephus also says that Gentiles, like Greek rulers who are ruling over Israel, like for instance Herod, Herod saw some of these prophecies of the, of, of the Essenes, and after seeing them prophesy, they were convinced that the Essenes were legitimate prophets. So we have to take into, into consideration the possibility that the Essenes were prophets, because if they were, this would actually solve a lot of conundrums and mysteries of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The mysteries it would solve would be basically the Pesher texts. I've mentioned the Pesher texts in other seminars that we did. The Pesher texts are basically the commentaries of the Essenes, but the commentaries were basically held as authoritative commentaries or inspired so these were the commentaries of the Essenes that they accepted as prophetic, inspired. Now the problem is, these Pesher texts refer to characters very ambiguously. It doesn't, they don't ever mention really any names of any individuals. So they have like code names. So they have, they mention someone called the teacher of righteousness and the wicked priest. So scholars are scratching their heads trying to figure out who, who are these people? 
and they, they try to make the evidence fit, even though there's no history, historical data to back up their identifications. For instance, they try to link the wicked priest to, let's say, uh, Jonathan Maccabee or other Maccabean individuals. Well, the problem is what's attributed to the wicked priest in the Dead Sea Scrolls does not match any historical figure in the second century or first century BC that we're aware of. So the problem of scholars is that they're assuming that these texts could not possibly be prophetic. However, it is my perspective that these actually are referring to future individuals that hadn't come yet. So the reason they didn't mention the people's names is because they hadn't even come yet. So they didn't know what their names would be. They didn't know who the righteous, the teacher of righteousness would be. They didn't know who the wicked priest would be. All they knew was uh, concepts about them, characteristics about who, what they would do, what, who they would be. They didn't know the actual names. This seems to best support the history and because, I will, as I will later show, there's just so many things that strikingly fit with the Messiah Yeshua of the New Testament, and they don't fit any other historical figure. So, but also to, to show that the scholars are wrong about this is that they actually have some pastures where they mention individuals by name. So they have a pesher to of, Na, of the prophet Nahum, and they mention two Greek rulers. One of them is Demetrius, and another one is Antiochus. So the fact that they're actually referring to other people by their names shows that they weren't intentionally trying to hide the names of the teacher of righteousness and the the wicked priest. They didn't even know the names, otherwise they would have mentioned them, just like they mentioned Demetrius and Antiochus. So what is the Petra method? It is very strikingly similar to what we see in the New Testament. There are many passages in the New Testament where the apostles interpret and apply passages to the Messiah or to prophecies of future times, which in their original context don't really seem to have anything to do with the Messiah. So we have instances like the virgin birth of Isaiah chapter 7. That's quoted as a Messianic prophecy. But when you look at the context, it's actually talking about something that would be a sign in that very day of, of the king in Isaiah's lifetime. And yet the apostles attribute a Messianic signification to it. There are many other examples of different passages of scripture which in their original context have nothing to do with the Messiah or, or prophecies of latter days, but then the apostles apply it to, their, to the end times in like an allegorical type of sense or a prophetic type, a messianic type. So for instance, in the Law of Moses, there are a bunch of laws for how to do sacrifices and, and the festivals. None of these in their original context have anything whatsoever to do with the Messiah. However, as many of us have discovered by studying the scriptures, these festivals and sacrifices seem to have amazing types of Yeshua, the Messiah. So this is the type of Pesher method of applying passages that literally have nothing to do with a certain topic, but drawing out types and analogies, they can reveal future prophecies. And this is what they did with the Pesher method. They did Peshers on the prophets. So Isaiah, we have Peshers of Isaiah, we have of the Psalms, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Hosea and Micah. We don't have any other Peshers, unfortunately, because the Dead Sea Scrolls are very fragmentary. Oh, wait, there's one, I think there's one for Zephaniah, but it's very fragmentary. But the, the Peshers that we do have offer us an amazing picture of what the Essenes believed about their conception of the Messiah. So, first of all, I don't know, in many other documents of commentaries that were written in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that 
they applied certain passages that we apply, they applied them also to the Messiah. So there's a common accusation made against Christians and Messianics, or Nazarenes, whichever you prefer. There's a common accusation by Jews that these passages are, that it comes from Christianity, that these prophecies never had anything to do with the Messiah, and then Christians came along and started randomly applying stuff to the Messiah. The problem with this theory of the Jews is that the Dead Sea Scrolls contradicts it. It basically shows that the Essenes, who were Jews and not Christians, they had, they were the source or the predecessors of this type of messianic interpretation. So a lot of prophecies that we attribute and that Christians attribute to the Messiah actually have their origination in Judaism and specifically in Essene Judaism. So I'm going to go and discuss some of the what we can glean from these Pesher texts. They refer to this individual as a teacher of righteousness. He was someone who was to bring, he was to restore the law for the people. He was to be the correct interpreter of the law because the law was hidden from the people. The correct meaning was concealed. But the teacher of righteousness would come and reveal the truth about how to keep the law properly. So the teacher of righteousness, he would teach the truth. Now, this teacher, we are told, he was to form a new covenant. Sounds familiar, right? The new covenant. That's what the New Testament attributes to Yeshua, of him starting a new covenant. And we also see in the Old Testament, like with Jeremiah, there is a prophecy of the new covenant. Now, what did they understand, the Essenes, what did they understand the new covenant was? Based on their writings, we see that their understanding was that the new covenant was a covenant of repentance. So the first covenant, as we see in the Old Testament, was obey the law. If you don't obey the law, you will, you will inherit eternal death. But the new covenant actually gives us a chance to be restored. It gives us the, basically the new covenant is a way of receiving forgiveness of sins that we couldn't receive in the old covenant. That's what, how the Essenes understood the New Covenant. It was a covenant of repentance. And they believed peculiar, peculiarly that the New Covenant was formed in a place called Damascus. Well, as I said my theory in the former seminar, it is my understanding that the Essenes actually started at Qumran, and that Qumran originally was known by the name of Damascus. Uh, there is some evidence to support the idea, but it's not 100%. Uh, but so I believe, though, that it is the case that Qumran was where the Essenes started and that it was known as Damascus, and a lot of scholars go with that idea is most likely the case. And so now the New Covenant of the Essenes came before Yeshua, whereas Yeshua in the New Testament, he introduced the New Covenant as if it was a, a, a new thing. So is this a contradiction? Is my understanding, based on so many similarities between, between the Essenes and what Messiah taught, is that the Essenes were basically the forerunners, or the, they were preparing the way for the Messiah. They applied that prophecy of Isaiah to themselves, their community, going out into the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord preparing the way of Yahweh. So, preparing the way of the Messiah. So, their understanding of the New Covenant, even though the Messiah brought the New Covenant in later, they were preparing the way, so they introduced the idea of a New Covenant prior to the Messiah. Now, they referred to some of their enemies. They had some enemies, in the, uh, according to the Essenes. These are also unspecified en enemies. They are primarily traitors, so traitors to the New Covenant. Then there was someone known as the Wicked Priest, and there was someone known as the Man of the Lie. Now, the Wicked Priest, scholars are pretty convinced that this is a playful, this is, this is a play on words in Hebrew, because the word for Wicked Priest sounds very similar to the words in Hebrew for high priest. 
So they're very, scholars are pretty confident that the wicked priest that the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to was a high priest. And this high priest was an enemy and a great antagonist against the teacher of righteousness. And there was this man of a lie. The man of a lie seems to be connected with the traitors. It doesn't give too much information in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but so the man of a lie was in cahoots with the wicked priest and betrayed the teacher of righteousness. I had to do more study on this, but tentatively I attribute the man of the lie to Judas Iscariot. Consider him to be one of the same with the man of the lie. Uh, but more research and study needs to be done to confirm that identification. Now, we're also told in the Petra text that we're told about a group known as the Katim. And the Katim were, were, according to the Essenes, they were to defeat Israel and send them into exile and overthrow them. Based on descriptions of the Katim, it's pretty unanimous understanding of the scholars that the Katim are, is referring to the Romans. So the Romans, according to the, these texts, came in, invaded Israel, and overpowered it, and eventually destroyed it. And this would come to happen in the first century, as we know. Now, there's a, they refer to, in their Pesher texts, to a house of Absalom. This is another code type of phrase. Scholars try to understand what this means, house of Absalom. It seems to refer to the incident between David and his son Absalom. Basically, his son Absalom, in the story of David, uh, was his own family, but then he, he in a sense, betrayed, he betrayed David. And we're told the house of Absalom were silent when the teacher of righteousness was rebuked. So the teacher of righteousness was rebuked by his enemies, but the house of Absalom were, were silent when this was going on. So they were not defending him, and, and they basically betrayed him. So these were former, seems to be former followers of him, former disciples that defected over to the, the side of the wicked who opposed the teacher of righteousness. Here is a very striking thing that does not fit any individual except the, the, of Yeshua in the New Testament. We're told that the wicked priest, uh, when, when the teacher of righteousness took refuge on the Day of Atonement, a holy fast day and a festival day, he was persecuted by the wicked priest. So the teacher of righteousness took refuge on his holy day, but he was pursued by the wicked priest, and he tried to destroy the teacher of righteousness on his holy day. That's what their texts say. And he also tried to destroy his followers. We see this exact thing happening with Yeshua. However, it was the Passover, not the Day of Atonement. But we know that Passover was a type of Day of Atonement. So, this seems to best support the idea that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually a pro prophecy of Yeshua being persecuted on Passover because no other historical figure, no other historical figure was persecuted on a day of atonement that we're aware of that was a major messianic type of individual. So I'm also going to later on give more support to that idea that the day, of, the Passover was the day of Day of Atonement in a typology type of sense. But I, so now I want to mention that the same Pesher texts, they were very anti-Jerusalem and anti-Judah. They had designation, they referred to Ephraim and Manasseh. Who were these individuals? Or not individuals, who were these groups? A group of their enemies called Ephraim and Manasseh. But well, we know from the Old Testament that Ephraim and Manasseh were two sons of Joseph. Now, what we're told is that originally the 12 tribes were one house, but then after there was the incident with, with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, the 12 tribes split into two houses. There was the house of, of Judah, and there was the house of Joseph, or the house of Israel. The house of Joseph, we know the tribe of Joseph was split into two groups because 
Joseph's two sons were chosen by Jacob to be his own sons, we're told in Genesis. So these two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were the half-tribes of Joseph. So Ephraim and Manasseh represent the rebels, the, the individuals who have fallen away from the, the true Israel and the true Jerusalem, and they've gone to their own country. They've, um, they've basically fallen away. We, 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 what we see in the Old Testament is that, that the tribe of, or not the tribe, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Joseph, made their own festivals. They were much more wicked than faithful Judah, faithful, faithful Israel. So this was a code phrase of the Essenes to refer to two groups of Jews, which the Essenes considered to be betrayers of the true kingdom of God. And these two groups, scholars are convinced, and I myself am also convinced, refer to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Ephraim was the designation for the Pharisees. Manasseh was the designation for the Sadducees. What is attributed to these two groups by the Essenes? They are critiqued and rebuked by the Essenes as those who seek easy interpretations. What this basically comes out to be is that the Pharisees always try to find loopholes to make it easier to justify inconsistencies, to justify breaking the laws. But at the same time, they also had their interpretations to make it so that they could break the laws, but that other people couldn't. So there was this double standard going on as well. Now, there is a text in the Dead Sea Scrolls that is fragmentary, so scholars have to fill it in to try to understand what it's saying. I highly disagree with how they have filled it in. This text is a pressure to the prophet Nahum. And it basically what we're told is that it mentions crucifying people. And it mentions in crucifying in connection to the Pharisees. The scholars are convinced currently that, most of them that is, they're convinced that the Pharisees were being crucified in, that, in the passage. But the only way to support that by their idea is to fill in the passage to make it fit what they believe the context is saying. However, I believe their understanding is completely wrong because of the following context that, uh, that follows after that passage. Basically, after that passage, we see judgment on Israel and destruction on Judah. And basically, we're, we're told that there would be the Gentiles, because of something just referred to previously, their major wickedness, the Gentiles would destroy Israel, send them into exile and in war, plagues, and curses as a result of Israel's wickedness. So this context seems to support that the Pharisees were actually being accused of condemning innocent people on the, uh, on, and crucifying them, rather than the Pharisees being crucified. If this interpretation is correct that I presented, this is even a further striking support that the Essenes prophesied of Yeshua rather than describing a historical figure that there's no evidence ever existed. So we're also told in it's at least two, but I think even three different writings in the Essene documents that after the teacher of righteousness was to die, so he was prophesied of dying, afterwards there would be a period of about 40 years after the death of the teacher. And then after those 40 years, there would be revenge on those who had killed the teacher of righteousness. But what does the text describe these people as. They describe them as the men of war. So about 40 years after the death of the teacher, revenge would be had on them on the men of war. This, I believe, is a clear proof of Yeshua being prophesied by the Essenes because in no other case do we have 40 years after uh, the people who persecuted the teacher being revenged or avenged in in a war. But we have this exact thing with Yeshua. Basically, Yeshua 
we have his day of death or a year of death to be somewhere between the years 30 AD and 33 or perhaps 34 AD. But that's a, it's a small window of when we know he was probably, he probably died. And this passage, these passages in the Dead Sea Scrolls say about 40 years after the revenge would come on the men of war. What happened about 40 years after Yeshua died? What happened is there was a war, Rome started war with, with Israel, specifically the Pharisees primarily. Some Essenes were involved in it, but this war ended in catastrophe. It ended in the destruction of the temple and the exile of Israel. And this happened exactly 40 years, and it was on men of war. And so we don't have this correspondence with anyone else in any other part of history, as far as we are aware of. There are some people who try to say James, the apostle, was the teacher of righteousness. But 40 years after, as far as I'm aware of, but perhaps I don't, I haven't studied all of history as as in-depth as other people have, so perhaps there is something that supports some other historical individual. But as far as I'm aware of, for instance, for James, the apostle, he did not, 40 years after he died, there was not a war like this that happened, uh, as far as I'm aware. But if someone can show me, then you, know, you could send me that, and I can correct myself in a future seminar. But so, if that's the case, that what I've said is true, that no other historical individual fits these details except Yeshua, then this supports the idea that Yeshua truly was the teacher of righteousness that these scenes refer to. Uh, because all these things they're saying line up strikingly with what happened with Yeshua. So, let's see here. Um, now, there is a document in the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Melchizedek. Uh, it's a commentary on Melchizedek, and it's another Pesher type of text. And in this Melchizedek text, what we find is that their concept of Melchizedek was very similar to what we see in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews connects Melchizedek to the Messiah. So does the author of this commentary on Melchizedek in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're also told that in this text, Melchizedek is actually called the Messiah himself in, in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. He's also called Elohim. So they actually call Melchizedek Elohim. This is unbelievable correspondence because we know in the New Testament there seems to be evidence of uh, the Yeshua being called Elohim in some type of sense. And other apocryphal writings say this exact same thing. So the they're having they're both referring to the Melchizedek Messiah as Elohim. And what's even more striking, they connect they connect Messiah and Melchizedek with Jubilee and the year of Jubilee and the Day of Atonement. What do we see? in the Torah, the Law of Moses, we're told in, I think it's Deuteronomy, that on the Day of Atonement, every Jubilee, right before the year of Jubilee, you're supposed to, on the Day, on the day of Atonement, blow the shofar, or the trumpet, and the following year was when the year of Jubilee was to begin. So the Day of Atonement was, there was to be an announcement, a proclamation of the coming year of Jubilee that was to come in the following year. So, the Jubilee is connected to the Day of Atonement in this Melchizedek commentary of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they also connect it with Daniel, Daniel's prophecy of a coming anointed one for the 70 weeks. 70 weeks we know refers to 70 times 7 because a week is 7 years. So 70 times 7 years is 490 years, which is 10 Jubilee is exactly. So this Day of Atonement was in effect the ultimate Day of Atonement. It was the, the Jubilee of Jubilees and they described this, what would happen uh, at this time. 
they basically said that the Messiah, because they were quoting Daniel and applying the, past, the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 9 of Daniel, to, to Melchizedek Messiah and the Day of Atonement concept, and they actually say explicitly that the Messiah would atone for the sins of the people. He would atone for the sins of the people. This is unbelievable correspondence. Basically, we're being told that someone who had, is called Elohim, Messiah, Melchizedek, and that he would, on a day of atonement, after 490 years, at the exact time that Daniel prophesied, he would come and atone for the people's sins. This doctrine was basically considered blasphemous by the Pharisees, as we're told in the Gospels. And yet the Essenes also believed it. So the New Testament writers and Christians did not derive, they did not make up this concept from paganism or just out of the blue, randomly. They actually derived it from the Essenes, it seems. The evidence seems to support this, that a lot of their so-called original concepts are actually not truly original at all, but they actually have their roots in Essene Judaism. Now that's like the amazing information about the Messiah uh, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. But so when I mentioned earlier that the Dead Sea Scroll writings say that that the teacher of righteousness was persecuted on the Day of Atonement in his place of refuge, this Melchizedek commentary says the, basically it applies the Day of Atonement to when he would atone for the people. So obviously this was not necessarily the actual Day of Atonement, in other words, the tenth day of the seventh month, but it was a Day of Atonement where the people were atoned for. And so this supports the idea that the Day of Atonement isn't necessarily literally the, the tenth day of the seventh month in these Pesher texts. It, it seems to support the possibility that when it describes the Day of Atonement in that one Pesher I mentioned, that it's actually referring to Passover. And if this is the case, because Passover is actually a Day of Atonement, we're told, if that's the case, then this is the only, the only historical individual that we are aware of which matches the Pesher text exactly, because he went to his place of refuge on Passover. We, are, we know that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane on Passover when he observed it. We're told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that they observed Passover that same day that he went into Gethsemane. The Gospel of John seems to say that Passover was, hadn't happened yet, but the Synoptic Gospels actually say that he did observe Passover already. So, if this is the case, then this is just a, an amazing correspondence between what we have in the New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes. But, so I'm going to leave off from the Messiah and I'm going to go more towards the theology the theology of the Essenes, because there's also some amazing connections. Sorry, I'm back. Okay. Um, I just want to check on something. Okay, so, so they believed, uh, so they were, according to what our sources tell us, Josephus and their documents, they were peacemakers, so they sought to make peace with others, and coincidentally, we're also told in the New Testament that that's a characteristic that the Messiah, Yeshua, emphasized especially that they were peacemakers, or that they were to be peacemakers. They were also abundant for fidelity. They were very faithful and loyal, characteristically. Now, we're told that in their own writings, we're told that no man was to do evil for evil. They were not to do evil to others who did evil to them. They were only to do good to others. So this is actually a correspondent with the New Testament, and this goes against the idea of some people who try to say that the Essenes were full of hate and didn't love others, and that they uh, were contrary to what Yeshua said. So as I explained in the other seminar that we did, they believed that you had to hate the wicked, but at the same time they also did not consider it okay ever to do evil to the wicked. They were only to do good for them. And we're told by Hippolytus, who actually considered the Essenes to be heresies, uh, excuse me, heretics, so he would not have wanted to paint them in a good light, but he tells us that the Essenes prayed for their enemies. 
And this, we're told that uh, the Yeshua taught this. But Pharisees uh, didn't emphasize it as much to pray for their enemies, as far as I'm aware of. Now, we're told also by, I think it's also again Hippolaus, or another church father, I can't remember which, but we're told by one of those church fathers who discusses the Essenes, he says, some Essenes do not call anyone Lord except God. Now that kind of sounds familiar, right? The, in the New Testament, we're told that do not call anyone, I think it's Lord, uh, do not call anyone Lord except God, or do not call anyone Father, things like that. It's a striking agreement right there. Now, they believed, the Essenes considered death of the righteous to be a good thing, not a curse. So, death, we're always associated with a negative understanding. But it's not, it didn't originally have this negative understanding. Death was actually supposed to be part of life. It was a good thing in its intended t purpose and time. What's bad is when death happens for a frivolous purpose, a vain reason. So murder, selfish reasons, just anything that's ending some uh, individual life for sinful reasons. That's the bad death. But if the death of the righteous happened in a way that was good and honored their life, then, sorry about the noise in the background, um, then basically they considered the death of the righteous to be a good thing and not a curse. Because we all have to die eventually, and this was actually the original requirement. There was always to be our bodies being destroyed. So they did not consider the fall of Adam to create death. They believed it created a, a much quicker death. In other words, if, if the fall of Adam hadn't happened, we would have li been living perpetually as long as we didn't hurt ourselves. So we wouldn't have aged. After we got to a certain point, we wouldn't have grown old. We would have stayed at, like, say, 30 years old or something. But what happened because of Adam is now the earth is corrupted physically, diseases, etc., so that now people will, even if they're not being attacked by people, they will start to die because of old age. And that's what they understand. So that death was always supposed to happen originally. So they don't consider death in and of itself a bad thing because God created death. So he wouldn't create something that's bad. So all they were told by Josephus, and this is also supported by their writings like the Book of Enoch, that all souls are immortal. So after people die, they their souls continue to live. The reason they believed this was because also they believed in something called pre-existence. They believed that souls were created on the very first day of creation. We're, they're told this in Jubilees, the book of Jubilees. We're told that every soul that would ever come to exist was created on that first day. And we're told in Genesis, all of creation was finished within six days. So all that would mean that all souls had to already be created. So all souls, before they were born or conceived, they were, they were existing. So, they all, so the Essenes, in consistency with this idea, believe that after, after people died, their souls continued living on. Josephus says that they believed that, that the dead who were wicked during their lifetime, they experienced conscious punishment or torment after death. And Josephus even goes to the lengths to associate the Essene concept with with pagan Greek mythology. He said they, the Essenes believed almost identically with what the Greeks believed about the afterlife. So, for instance, Hades is a very similar concept to Sheol. The Essenes, their understanding of Sheol was almost identical to the Greek understanding of Hades. That's what Josephus says. So the idea that Christians invented a lot of this stuff from paganism seems also to be diminished because if these things truly did come from pagan influence, it had to have been much more ancient because we already see this type of concepts and ideas in the Essene Judaism, which precedes Christianity by several hundred years.
So they believed also in the resurrection of all the dead. Josephus seems to indicate that the Pharisees did not believe the wicked would be resurrected into bodies, but that they would either cease to exist or just be punished in a they'd be punished somehow, but they wouldn't be given a glorified body. But the Essenes, it seems from the sources we have, that they believed in resurrection of all dead into glorified bodies. And the reason why is because they also believed, according to their writings, in unending an unending punishment for the wicked. This is a difficult concept for many to accept, and it's also connected with people saying that it came from paganism, the idea of never-ending punishment. These, these concepts, however, have a wide variety in literature. We see it a lot in various apocryphal writings and certain passages even in the regular scriptures like the New Testament and some parts of the Old Testament seem to imply a type of unending punishment for the wicked. This is at least how the Essenes understood it. Now I want to discuss something that's very crucial to the Essene understanding. Um, basically, the Essenes believed in complete and total predestination. What does this mean? They basically believed that before anything happened, before any, like the first moment of time, God looked at everything that was ever happened and he predestined every single choice and action and event that would ever happen in all of history. This, at first, well, people will dismiss this idea because it's associated with Calvinism. But here's the difference between the Calvinists and the Essenes. The Essenes actually believed in free will. So they believed we all have free will, and yet they also believed in total predestination. How can these two ideas mesh or correspond? I'm just going to give you an idea of how this is reconciled. Basically, consider for a moment that we, we agree that God knows all things, right? So. If he knows all things, then basically he, he sees everything that's going to happen as a result of something, and he can say, okay, I'm going to have that happen, or he could do something to intervene, because we know he's, all pow he's powerful. He can, he can intervene and stop, put a stop to something. We're told that he came and he parted the waters, he parted the Red Sea, he did all these things against Pharaoh, to, basically to force him to free, to free Israel. So he can... God has the power to, to change the course of history, okay? So, basically, as I mentioned, the Essenes believed that every single, every single soul pre-existed and was created on the first day. So, that means when I was born, before I was born, God had to, God had to say, okay, I'm looking at everything that this soul is going to do in this body, and okay, that's what I'm going to approve of this, and I'm going to I'm going to place this soul into this body. So, if this is the case, I'll give a couple examples of how clearly God has predestined basically everything because of this type of idea. So, for, let's take Hitler. So, when God was taking the soul of Hitler and about to place it in the body, He basically saw everything Hitler would do, and he, God could have He He was thinking, okay. I could put Hitler's soul in any single body that could ever exist for all of history. He could have made Hitler to be Adam. He could have put Hitler's soul into the first human body. He could have put Hitler's soul into an African who was a slave in America. But God chose seeing everything that this soul would do in this German body. He saw it all and said, okay, I'm going to put Hitler, I'm going to put the soul in this body, even though I know everything that it's going to do in this body. But I, have, I decided to put it in this body anyway. So he could have made the Holocaust not happen by putting Hitler's soul in some other body. But he wanted Hitler's soul to be in that particular body for his reasons, and so he put it in that body, knowing full well that it would lead to all this horrible stuff because. He knew if Hitler would be put into an African-American's body, then he wouldn't have had the ability to do a Holocaust. He would have been unable to, to reach that potential. Similarly, whether or not you agree with Paul or think he's valid or not, 
Paul has a major influence on the entire history of the world. He could have done the same thing. He could have made Paul to be an African slave in America, or he could have done any, he could have put Paul's soul in any single body he wanted, but he chose to put Paul's soul in the body he, he put it in, knowing full well the entire course of history that would come as a result of Paul being born in that body. So there's many other type of ideas which support the idea that God has predestined every single action because he chose which body he would he was to place our souls in and he chooses when to interact with us so he didn't have to choose Moses he didn't have to choose Abraham but he chose to choose them and by him choosing them he changed the course of history every single action and thing you've done in your entire life would not have happened if he did not choose Abraham or Moses so he predestined everything you chose simply by choosing Abraham or Moses because he could have cho not chosen them and by not choosing them you would not have done any of the actions you've done you would have done other things in a different body but that, so this is the a same thing of understanding it does not eliminate free will basically it uses all the possibilities available to God and he picks which possibilities he wants to happen based on his foreknowledge ability. And so he basically made the greatest good uh, in, in the Essene understanding. So he made the Holocaust happen because he, he put Hitler's soul in that body he did. But we don't know all history. We don't know all things that God knows. It is almost certain that God knew that if he did not put Hitler's soul into that body, Someone else would have been put in that body. And basically, the entire course of history would be different, and it would most likely have been much worse. There could have been multiple holocausts. So it's possible he actually diminished how horrible it would be by choosing only one holocaust, and he chose to have Hitler do it. So we have to think in a perspective of universal history. God's actions and predestination type of ideas works in a type of entire scope of history and he does it for the greatest good to help us that's the uh seen understanding of the predestination how that corresponds with free will now uh i just want to mention several more things and then we'll wrap it up for this day so we're told by josephus that they were so they had a simple diet and a regular course of life, and their way of life was so holy and righteous that the majority of Essenes, or not the same majority, but it says many, many Essenes lived more than 100 years. But what we're told, what history seems to say is that the Essenes, I mean, excuse me, it seems to support the idea that humans in general did not live that long back at the time. They had a much shorter life expectancy, but the Essenes, many of them were living to 100 years. So they had to be getting something right. They had to be understanding something that other people weren't. They were very holy. They were living a very righteous life. We're told they studied scriptures and writings of the ancients that no one else studied. In the book of Noah, we're told in the book of Jubilees that there was a book of Noah and that Noah wrote a bunch of medicines of how to heal the different things. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had the book of Noah. And so that means that they had access to a to the information of these amazing medicines that no one else knows about. Unfortunately, the full book of Noah was not preserved, so we don't know what those medicines are. But the Essenes knew because they had that book. And they had, they studied all kinds of natural medicine. And natural medicine is superior to the, the artificial medicine of the doctors that we, we come to know this uh, from many of us who are trying to observatory lifestyle are realizing that their their medicines and drugs are actually have many horrible side effects and bad things there's a lot of good things they're doing with their medicines but it always involves horrible side effects but the natural medicines eliminate the majority of the bad side effects because these are natural medicines are designed by god so they don't have really any flaws in them because they're natural so that the essenes use natural medicines and they were very healthy and lived a very long time, more than most people. So that might be an indication for some people who want to live a long time to consider the possibility of becoming an Essene. Uh, so 
Now, as I mentioned, they were they were prophets. Uh, they they were considered prophets, and their evidence seems to support that they actually did have the ability to prophesy. Now, what's amazing is when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the 20th century, that was when Israel was destroyed. Uh, excuse me, restored. Yeah, restored. So, what documents did they find uh, it, that make it so amazing? Basically, they found the war scroll. The war scroll was found in the exact year that Israel was born in the 20th century. Okay, the war scroll. What does the war scroll talk about? A future war. It gives in-depth, detailed instructions of how Israel, the nation, is to fight a war against like the whole world. And it gives very specific details. So either this is a false prophet because of how clear the details are, or this is true prophecy and it's going to happen. Now, this war scroll is amazing because of all the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found, almost all of them were very fragmentary, fragmentarily preserved. But the war scroll was almost preserved perfectly intact in its entirety. So this war scroll claims to be a key source for Israel of how to fight the war in the last days. And what do you know? It's perfectly preserved and rediscovered at the exact year that Israel is reborn. Secondly, we also have Copper Scroll. What do we have in the Copper Scroll? We're told that in the Copper Scroll, there's a bunch of treasures, which is a lot of money, worth a lot of money. Buried treasures. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Buried treasures and Basically, if Israel was to find this, it would it would significantly help their economy, and you know this was also preserved perfectly intact the entirety of the whole thing. It's basically a treasure map, uh, but it hasn't been deciphered yet. And the reason it probably hasn't been deciphered yet is one of two reasons: either the treasure is lost, or the treasure is supposed to be found by the true people of true faith. So once people repent then wisdom will be given to them and they'll find all these amazing treasures. Two other texts that were found, one was the Temple Scroll. It was the amazing story of the, of the reception of the Temple Scroll was basically one of the Bedouin Arabs had a Temple Scroll and a significant military leader of Israel thought the Temple Scroll was so important that he went in and uh, he had the military forcibly remove the Temple Scroll from this individual. And this event of getting the Temple Scroll happened right around the same time that they recaptured Jerusalem. And the Temple Scroll claims to be a text of from to Moses, the Law of Moses, of how to build a temple in Jerusalem. And we also have a New Jerusalem text that was found, which gives laws about how to build the New Jerusalem. So it's just very striking that all these amazing documents, specifically for Israel, in the last days, were discovered in the last days, all around the same time when Israel was reborn. And if Israel were to believe these documents are valid, it would it would just completely revolutionize Israel, and they would have a revival. And evidence to suggest that they, this might actually happen is this war scroll that I told you about. They actually built Israel actually built a shrine for it. They built this amazing shrine the shrine of the war in Israel, and that's where the war scroll is is placed and stored. But so they just, these are some amazing things that we have seen from the, from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Essenes. I'd like to just continue this just a little bit longer because I've almost finished what I want to talk about for today. So if you can all just be a little more patient, I will finish the rest of this it's very quick. So. We're told in the Dead Sea Scrolls of a group known as the Sons of Zadok. These were priests. Now, most scholars seem to have considered that Zadok was this some mysterious individual. But I've studied this, these things a lot, and I'm personally convinced that this is completely wrong. This is based on a Masoretic text understanding with vowel markings. The problem is the Dead Sea Scrolls did not have vowel markings, and they had more archaic rules of grammar. So Zadok can mean the person Zadok, but it can also mean righteousness or individuals who have been made righteous. So in my understanding, the sons of Zadok, it's not the, the sons of a man named Zadok, but it's the sons of righteousness. In other words, the, the righteous priests, the priests who truly obey the law, the laws of God. 
Ezekiel is the source of this phrase, sons of Zadok, or sons of righteousness. So it is my understanding that the sons of Zadok is just basically the Essene way of describing the truly righteous priesthood, because they opposed the Jerusalem priesthood, they opposed the priesthood that had been usurped by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We're told in Josephus' writings and in Philo that the Essenes did not participate in the sacrifices of the temple of Jerusalem. This, at first, will seem to contradict what the New Testament says, but several things. First of all, the sacrifices of... When Josephus says that they did not do sacrifices, he was describing how the Essenes lived in the first century, not how they lived in the first century B.C. So, in my understanding, the Essenes stopped doing stopped considering sacrifices valid uh, temporarily because of the temple being defiled. The temple was basically defiled when when Yeshua was was killed, and then when the when the when we're told in the New Testament the veil split in half. That was basically a sign of judgment. There are actually writings like. As I said, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, they accepted as scripture. In that book, there's actually prophecy of the veil being torn in half as a sign of judgment on Israel. So when the Essenes saw this, they would have known, okay, the temple is now defiled and we cannot use it anymore. They still try to send, we're told Josephus tried to send gifts to the people, uh, to the priests, like tithes and dedication, like grain offerings, but they didn't do animal sacrifices anymore because the blood blood was no longer to be shed there, because they had defiled it by shedding the blood of the Messiah. Now, this is actually supported by the apocryphal writings. Jackson has shared with you all before the writings of Clement, the Nazarene Acts of, the Eight of Clement and Peter. And these writings actually say that sacrifice was removed by the Messiah what does this mean, though? In my understanding, when Messiah came and then he, he, he died, he basically made it so that now only Nazarenes or only followers of the Messiah can do animal sacrifices. So anyone who is now a, who does not accept him cannot do animal sacrifices. So in my understanding, the, he did not abolish all sacrifices, but he abolished the impure sacrifices of the Pharisees, and that basically ceased all valid animal sacrifices in the temple in the first century. So this actually supports what certain passages in the New Testament seem to say, and passages in the Apocrypha of the Apostles seem to say that the sacrifices were removed because they've been defiled. They will be restored in the latter days once the priesthood is holy and repents. And but there's only one passage which people may cite against this idea, and that's Paul sacrificing in the temple. Well, as I said, they were only against the animal sacrifices after Christ. And so when Paul went and sacrificed in the temple, and they did the, they did the offerings for the Nazarite vow, we're told in the Torah that if you're too poor or if you're unable to do an animal sacrifice, you can substitute it, substitute it with a grain offering. As a, as a replacement, sufficient substitute. So Paul could have easily done that. He could have easily done the grain offering to show he does not reject the law of Moses. He just rejects the Pharisees' right to do sacrifices of animals. And um, I'll say one final thing, and this will be it for today. Um, so we see the Essenes in the Dead Sea Scrolls were very they harped majorly on these. They picked two groups specifically, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now we're told by Josephus there was only three main groups of Judaism, the Essenes, Pharisees, and the Sadducees. So the Essenes only condemned the two, the, the two other groups that existed. So, but what do we see in the New Testament? First of all, we don't see a single mention of the Essenes once, nor do we see any condemnation of them at all. What we see is, woe to the Pharisees, woe to the Sadducees. And all this, like, really anti-Pharisee words and language, strong language against them. And, as I said, Sadducees, Pharisees, they even go and make an anti-Samaritan polemic. They even mention other obscure groups, like Judas the Galilean, his sect that he tried to have. 
The New Testament mentions all these groups, but it doesn't ever mention the Essenes once, because all the other groups it mentions, it was always to condemn those groups. So we don't see a single condemnation anywhere of the Essenes in the New Testament. And what's even more compelling? Yeah, because they were the, because they were the Essenes. So they wouldn't refer to the Essenes when they were themselves the Essenes. And they, their ministry was of, of repentance to the unsaved Jews, to the Pharisees and Sadducees. And we have other apocryphal documents that list heresies of Judaism and heresies of Christianity. So we have a writing, uh, the same writing I just re I mentioned earlier that Jackson show, shared with us of the recognition, the recognition of Clement, the, which he refers to as the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles. And in this, we're given a list of heresies, uh, Judaism heresies. We're told of day Baptists, we're told of Pharisees, we're told of Sadducees, Samaritans, it lists every group, but it doesn't list the Essenes. And there's another document called the Apostolic Constitutions. And this claims to be by the Apostles. And in the, the Ethiopian version, it mentions, it does not mention the Essenes, but it mentions every other Judaism group as a heresy. And it mentions every other Christian agnostic group as a heresy. In the Greek version of the Apostolic Constitutions, it does mention the Essenes, but it seems to mention the Essenes in a way that is actually endorsing them. Basically, it gives a list of each type of Judaism group that was that was a what what the apostles refer to it in that text as a heresy, and then it says, "But the Essenes separated from all these groups, and they kept the laws of their fathers." So they describe the Essenes as separating away from all these heretics and keeping the laws of their fathers. So all these apocryphal documents, there's not a single condemnation of the Essenes, nor in the New Testament, and there's a bunch of condemnation of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and in these documents, there's so many praises and connections with teachings and beliefs of the Essenes, it's unbelievable. So it seems to me that it's clearly the evidence that the New Testament writers and these apocryphal writers were actually some type of Essene converts to Messianic religion, to the Nazarene religion. So they were, in effect, Messianic Essenes. So to wrap it up, the, what the Pharisees, they opposed the Pharisees. And why did the Essenes oppose the Pharisees? Why did Messiah oppose the Pharisees? Here's the reason. The tendency of the Pharisees were to alter proper times, tendency towards leniency, loosing requirements, loopholes, creating unjustified exceptions, suppressing or hindering justice and punishment, an eye for an eye justification of selfishness slash greed. They were hypocrites and they condemned others for things that, uh, they condemned things that others do that they don't condemn themselves for, even though they do the same things. And they were impure and unholy. Um, so that was like the main understanding of the Essenes. Uh, so that's pretty much all to share for today, kind of long-winded there at the end. But so that's the presentation. And next time, uh, what we're going to discuss, if you stay tuned, is I'm going to go through, and now all this stuff that I've shared and more, I'm going to condense it into a list of basically showing all the correspondences, all the agreements between the New Testament and Apocryphal writings and Essene doctrines. I'll go through each Essene doctrine as quickly as possible and show where in the New Testament and or Apocrypha that this doctrine is taught by the apostles. So I hope you stay tuned to that next session. And that's it. Thank you all. Hey Amen. That was excellent. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank, Very good. Excellent. excellent. Shalom to you all. Yahweh bless you. I'll put this up on the website here within the next hour or so. Bye-bye now. I just want to give sort of a, a context of some of what we've been discussing before, just very briefly. This is our fifth seminar that we've been doing. The first four seminars have been, the first one was just basically a general overview of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The second and third seminar were about the Essene beliefs and way of life. And the fourth seminar was about 
their theology primarily. This seminar is basically what I'm going to try to show today. Um, there's some, okay. Uh, what I'm going to try to show today is basic. It is my contention that the Messiah and the Apostles were Essenes. And I'm going to try to show what I believe to be very convincing evidence that this is the case. So I'm going to go through all the evidence that I've compiled, but because there's so much to cover, some of it I'm only going to reference. And if you're interested in some of these connections, you can do some more research or you can ask me more questions about these specific connections. But so, before we begin though, I want to give a couple things to keep in mind when you're considering this possibility. First of all, if the Essenes are right, and if the Messiah and the Apostles were Essenes, they actually believe that they could add extra commandments, new commandments, based on prophets. If a prophet was called by God, he could be inspired to speak to speak new commandments to the people that are not written in the law of Moses. This is a stumbling block for people in the Messianic movement and the Nazarene movement of the idea of new commandments being added. But in order for the Essene religion to be true, in order for Messiah and the Apostles to be Essenes, this concept would have to be valid, that new commandment can actually indeed be which were not written in the Law of Moses. So that's the thing that needs to serve when being open about the ability here. And so the second thing I want to emphasize that this is going to be the main, um, a main source of the connections is that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, they have the biggest Bible of all Christians uh, in the world, in all church denominations. They have 81 books in their Bible, that's how they count it. Uh, but some of the books they count differently than others, so it's not as big of a difference as it might seem. But so the, the, the main ones the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible has that all other churches don't are very significant in relation to the Essenes. These are the main ones. The Old Testament, they have Tobit, the Book of Judith, the Wisdom of Solomon, they have Second Ezra, and they have an Apocryphon of Jeremiah, and they have Enoch and the Book of Jubilees. Those last two in particular are just unbelievable. If it were not for the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, none of us, none of you guys who who love the Book of Enoch or who love the Book of Jubilees, none of us would be able to have access to the to those books because it is through the Ethiopian Orthodox Church that those books have been preserved. And they are the only Christians, the only Bible group that has preserved those books. The Apocryphon of Jeremiah has not been fully preserved by the Ethiopians, but the part that they did not preserve has been partially discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's some amazing connections between the Ethiopian Orthodox Church Bible canon and the Dead Sea Scrolls, because three of their books that are not in any other Bible canon were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Book of Enoch, Book of Jubilees, and the Apocryphon of Jeremiah. In no other Bible canon, but it is in the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible canon somehow. It's a mystery how that came to happen. And so that's only half the story. The, the second part of this is their New Testament. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church is the exception to all other Christian groups, and um, even among Messianics and Nazarenes. They are unique in that their New Testament is not the 27 books that we all are familiar with. It's the 27 books plus eight other books which they believe were written by the apostles themselves. 
these books, there's one that's the letter from the apostles. Then there's a book of covenant, and there is what their book is called, Didascalia, and there's four books of Synodos, and then the most significant book that they have is the Revelation of Peter. They call it sometimes as just the Book of Clement. Now, their New Testament, the extra books that they have, only some of those books have been translated into English. Some of those books have never been translated into English before, and the one book in particular that's the most significant, the Revelation of Peter, I believe I may be the only American who has read this whole thing because this book is so rare and so unknown that pretty much no one knows how to find it or no, no one knows where to get it. But I, through a lot of my study and research, was able to find where this book is. And other people know about the other countries, but pretty much in America, no one has read this book. So I may be the first one who's read this book. And this book is crucial to establishing my premise that the apostles uh, were Torah observant. What's striking is that a lot of the extra books of the Apocrypha of the New Testament, which claim to be written by the apostles, actually teach Torah observance. It teaches observance of the Sabbath. It teaches observance of different parts of the Law of Moses. So these are amazing sources. And when we look at these sources, we see that these sources teach, they teach the Law of Moses observance, but they also teach additional commandments. And these additional commandments very often are identical with the Essene commandments or they're very similar to the Essene commands. So that's just the perspective I want you guys to approach with this information. That they, these books, these extra apocrypha books, they're teaching the law of Moses observance and extra commandments that are usually exact equivalents with the, with the Essenes. And so I'm going to present the evidence that the, the original apostles, so Jewish Christianity, Nazarene movement, was in fact the Essene religion, just these Essenes came to believe that Yeshua was the Messiah, and that was the only difference in the beginning. They were in fact Essenes, reformed Essenes. So that's what this presentation is going to seek to demonstrate. Okay, so first of all, correspondence between the New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls with the Septuagint version. The Septuagint has many peculiar readings and extra passages that most people's Bibles do not have. Sometimes the New Testament quotes things that are not in our Old Testament, but which are in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of some Hebrew copies of the Bible that no longer exist. These Hebrew copies are no longer there. The Dead Sea Scrolls, when they were found, many of these Dead Sea Scrolls are so strikingly similar to the Septuagint is confident that the, the Septuagint was translated from a Hebrew manuscript very similar to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we have this connection, the correspondence between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament with quotations and readings of the Old Testament texts of Scripture. Now also, apocryphal texts, the New Testament accepted. For instance, when you go to the book of Jude, you see you see Jude, in verse 14 to 15, he's quoting from the prophecy of Enoch as authoritative. Similarly, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have this very thing of the book of Enoch being authoritative. And no other Jewish group in ancient times do we know of any evidence that they accepted Enoch as canonical or authoritative. But we have the Essenes, and we also have the New Testament authors and the early Christians. So there was also apocryphal texts, for instance, in the same letter of Jude, Jude quotes from a book that early church fathers had, but now is no longer preserved anymore, unfortunately. It's called the Testament and Assumption of Moses. It's in verse 8, verse 9 of, of the letter of Jude. 
And he quotes something that's not in our Old Testament, but which is in a extra Moses book. And this extra Moses book has many similar features to what we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's also in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, they quote something from Jeremiah, the prophet. But what they quote in Jeremiah 27, verse 9 to 10, is not in our Old Testament copies of Jeremiah, nor is it in the Septuagint or in the Dead Sea Scrolls Jeremiah. It is, however, in the Ethiopian Apocryphon of Jeremiah that I mentioned. So we see the apocryphal texts, there's connections with the Dead Sea Scrolls with what the New Testament accepted as authoritative. Now, something else that's very peculiar, the phrase Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit almost never appears in the Old Testament, but we see it so many times in the New Testament. Well, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this phrase, Holy Spirit, in reference to God, the deity, is used many times, more, more than any other type of literature at that time. We don't really see this phrase, Holy Spirit, used amongst Pharisees. We usually see something like Shekinah or Shekinah. We don't see usually the, as far as I'm aware of anyway, uh, mention of the Holy Spirit among the rabbinic writings. So we see the Essenes, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and the New Testament both refer to the Holy Spirit as a, a title or description of God himself. Now, next, Melchizedek. In the New Testament, in Hebrews, we're all very familiar with the writer of Hebrews' description of Melchizedek and his, connect, his comparison with Melchizedek to, the, to Yeshua, the Messiah. And he compares, he suggests that Yeshua was in the order of Melchizedek and that Melchizedek was like the Son of God. He's, he's comparing Melchizedek to the Messiah, uh, the writer of Hebrews. Well, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, we found a similar text in regards to Melchizedek. It's a commentary on the, a passage from the book of Leviticus about the year of Jubilee and about the Sabbath year type of concept. And they allegorize the year of Jubilee as referring to freedom from sins, deliverance from sinfulness that you were in bondage to, so being atoned. And they, when you read this Melchizedek text, Family the Dead Sea Scrolls, enough of it was preserved so that we can, we can read it with full confidence knowing what it said. And this text says that Melchizedek is the Messiah and that Melchizedek uh, was, pro was eventually going to atone for sinners. He was going to be the atonement for them so that their sins could be forgiven. And that this fulfillment of Melchizedek coming as the atonement for our sins would happen when Daniel prophesied in chapter 9, at the end of the 70 weeks, or at the end of the 490 years. Now, when you do the math of Daniel, depending where you start your count, it's somewhere between the 1st century B.C., and the first century A.D. of when the 490 years of Daniel finished. But so, this text said that Melchizedek would come basically in the first century B.C. or first century A.D., depending how you count. And it also, very striking, is that it refers to Melchizedek as Elohim. It calls him Elohim, or it calls him God. So it's suggesting that Melchizedek, the Messiah, would be a divine being. This is strikingly identical with what we see in the New Testament and various extra books of the Apocrypha. They consider Yeshua, the Messiah, a type of divine being who was, who was allowed to be called Elohim, or God. Um, now, there's also other texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls which were described the Messiah as, as atoning for sins, a very striking descriptions of the Messiah. And there's also prophecies of what would happen when the Messiah would come. They describe in the Dead Sea Scrolls that when the Messiah would come, there would be amazing miracles that had never happened before in such capacity. It would be healing, all types of healing. And it mentions the blind 
and lame, and I can't remember if it mentions leper or not, but it also mentions raising people from the dead. This is one of the most striking things because to raise someone from the dead was the ultimate miracle anyone could do. Basically, if you could raise someone from the dead, you prove that you are of God because that is just how impossible it is to raise someone from the dead. But so the Dead Sea Scrolls say when the Messiah would come, these types of things would happen. And the New Testament corresponds strikingly with this prediction in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He claims to be doing all these things, healing people, raising the dead, Yeshua claims this, and so the connection right there is couldn't be more striking and identical. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in writings accepted by the Dead Sea Scroll writers, like the Book of Enoch, because the Book of Enoch was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls partially, it uses terms nowhere else used in Jewish writings, particularly not used in the Pharisee writings, the rabbinic writings. It, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it refers to the Messiah as Son of God and Son of the Most High. These are some of the most controversial Messianic designations ever to be invented. The Pharisees in the New Testament were very, uh, very opposed to these terms. But we also see terms such as the Righteous One and the Elect One. In the, in the Gospel of Luke, it calls the Messiah the Elect One. Well, where does this phrase, Elect One, have Messianic connotation from? We don't see it in the Old Testament. We don't see it pretty much in almost any writings. But we do see it in the Book of Luke, which, as I said, the Essenes kept it in the Scrolls. We also see Beloved. Beloved was a Messianic designation in Apocryphal writings and in the New Testament writings but not in the Pharisaic writings. And the Son of Man, Son of Man was perhaps the most striking of all. The Messiah used it so many times of himself, but yet in Daniel, uh, excuse me, the only time we see it in the Old Testament that we have is in the book of Daniel. And it's not a very impressive reference, because all he says is, I saw someone that looked like a Son of Man. But when the Messiah refers to himself, he does not say, I am like a Son of Man. He says, I am the Son of Man. So basically, he is the definitive one, a special one that was prophesied to come. And Enoch is the only other source that we have which describes it in such striking similarity of, of language. The Son of Man, prophesied of a, of a divine messianic being that would come at, in a later time. So this connection right there. We also have a stone that was found. Many scholars believe it is authentic and from the Dead Sea Scroll region. Others do not think it's authentic, and still others think it's authentic, but they disagree with the interpretation because the reason is it's very fragmentary. So there are holes which make the context somewhat uncertain. But this stone, what it appears to say, the revelation of Gabriel, the apocalypse of Gabriel it's called, it appears to describe an individual being resurrected from the dead on the third day, and it's Gabriel commanding this individual to rise on the third day. Well, in the New Testament, we see a very similar thing of an angel, which is probably Gabriel, having the Messiah raised from the dead on the third day. So that's just a striking similarity right there. I mentioned in the one of the former seminars we did about the teacher of righteousness and the wicked priest mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm not going to rehash all that stuff today. I'm just going to emphasize that the teacher of righteousness and the wicked priest of all the study I've done, there is not a single other group of individuals that fit this so strikingly other than Yeshua and his and the high priest who persecuted him, Caiaphas. I believe these are the closest, the most striking uh, identifications, similarities to what the Dead Sea Schools refer to as the teacher of righteousness and the wicked priest. So I'm very confident in my own study that the Dead Sea Scrolls were actually prophesying of Yeshua as the teacher of righteousness and, and Caiaphas as the wicked priest. If this is not the case, then I believe the Dead Sea Scroll writers were just making something up that never happened because no other individuals fit what the Dead Sea Scrolls describe, either as a historical or as a prophetic reference. So, also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have the attitudes, blessed uh, blessed is this, you know, blessed be that. The beatitude type of style of literature in Hebrew writings was unprecedented, unknown, before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
what we saw in the New Testament. So it seemed like Messiah was coming out of nowhere with this, these new ideas, these new concepts. Um, but when the Sea Scrolls were discovered, we found similar type of ideas and language. So in reality, the Messiah was deriving his heritage from the Essene, or at least the greater Hebrew literature that existed at that time. Also, again, parables. We basically didn't have really any ancient parables that confirmed that, that parables existed in a wide variety prior to New Testament era. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, we, we found some parables, which give a context to the Messiah's parables, showing that his parables were just not random and out of the blue, but they fit within a very specific, uh, specific window of Hebrew thought that was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, John the Baptist, many scholars are convinced that John the Baptist wasn't a scene. And the, one of the primary reasons of this is where John the Baptist baptized. John the Bapti Baptist baptized in a place, in a Jordan River area, near the Dead Sea region. In fact, it was, it's so close to where the Dead Sea schools were found. One source that I read said he would be within about three hours walk of where the Dead Sea schools were found. That's how close John the Baptist was to where the Dead Sea Scroll writers, the Essenes, were located. And John the Baptist's ideas, a lot of them have similarities to the Dead Sea Scroll writers. Unfor unfortunately, though, we don't have too much about John the Baptist. All we have is a little bit of information from the New Testament. Not too much to go on. But his emphasis on baptism is unparalleled in other Jewish groups, but it is paralleled in the Essene group. Baptism as a prerequisite for forgiveness of sins. We don't see this commanded in the Old Testament, but John the Baptist is treating it as if it was a commandment, and the Essenes treated it the same way. And then we see in the New Testament, the apostles seem to treat it in the same way. You must be baptized to be saved. Now, Isaiah's prophecy, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The New Testament applied this to John the Baptist. John the Baptist considered himself a fulfillment of his prophecy. In the wilderness, he was preparing the way of the Messiah. Similarly, the Dead Sea Scrolls use the same passage to refer to themselves as being in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, preparing the way of the Messiah. So what is very likely to be the case is that John the Baptist inherited this idea, the in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, from the Essenes because this idea did not exist in other Jewish groups. It was only the Essenes and John the Baptist who thought of this prophecy of Isaiah, that, need, they, that they needed to be in the wilderness and prepare the way for the Lord, the coming of the Lord. So also in the New Testament, there's a phrase, brood of vipers. It's an insult that's used against the Pharisees, both by John the Baptist and the Messiah, Yeshua. We see this phrase nowhere else, but we do see it in some form in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it doesn't say, the translations that I've encountered do not use this exact phrase, but it says something like offspring of vipers or something like that. But offspring and brood is the same thing, just synonyms. So this, this insult, which was specifically used in both the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the New Testament, have no other in other writings, for example. Um, now, government obedience. It basically, in the New Testament, Paul mentions how we're supposed to be submitting to the, the governing authorities. And the context seems to support that the governing authorities he's talking about are the Romans and not, and not religious authority. And the interpretation that I presented of it being the government obedience, obedience to a secular government, is confirmed in other apocryphal writings which say the same thing, in, but in clearer terms. And also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, excuse me, not in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but in Josephus, who describes the Essenes. Josephus describes the Essenes as believing that all governments are ordained by God, and that therefore we are to obey them, or to submit to their authority. This same, this same language is used by Paul, that no government originates except from God. 
So the striking language similarity is there and connects the Essenes with what Paul said. Now, temple tax. Uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that the Essenes believed that the temple tax was only supposed to be paid once in an entire lifetime. But the Pharisees, we are well aware, of, based on history and the New Testament, is they required the payment of the temple, temple tax every year. Now, in the New Testament, what we see is the Messiah, when asked, do you pay the temple tax? Messiah's argument, or what he said about himself, was that once the slaves, or once the, the children become adults, they no longer need to, to pay this tax. But for their sake, we will pay it. And then he has the fish. He has the fish uh, bring the, the coin, and they give it as a tax. But so when Messiah's response only makes sense if he agreed with the Essenes. Otherwise, he's just going out of the way and is avoiding the topic, avoiding the issue, and not giving a direct answer. But if he believed as the Essenes believed, then his answer was very direct. It was, I don't believe it has to be done, but for their sakes, we will do it. Now, also a similar similarity here, an amazing one, is that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we're told if anyone was known to have violated a single precept of the commandments, they were not to be held as reliable witnesses. So in other words, people could be trusted by their word alone if they were if they were known to be sinless. If they were not sinless, their word alone could not be sufficient to prove anything. We see this argument used in the Gospel of John. Basically, they all are saying they witnessed they witnessed this woman commit adultery. But the Messiah said he was without sin, cast the first stone. Basically saying your authority or your witness will be accepted if you can first demonstrate that you are sinless. Otherwise, you are not a reliable witness on your word alone. There needs to be more than just your word here. And all of them, because they knew themselves to be sinners, they, they knew they could not prove the charge against her. So they walked away, and there was no one to condemn her. Even though the Messiah knew that she was, in fact, guilty, based on his, his being a prophet. And he told her to go and sin no more. But so, this teaching of the Messiah, that you have to be sinless, or he, was, he who is without sin cast the first stone, that's not in the Old Testament anywhere. However, it's, as I said, in Dead Sea Scrolls and nowhere else. The Pharisees did not teach this, but so the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Messiah taught this idea. A phrase in the New Testament occurs in Dead Sea Scrolls that, as far as I'm aware, doesn't really occur anywhere else. It's called poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This phrase, poor in spirit, occurs in the Dead Sea Scrolls in a book called the War Scroll. As, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't occur in other, in other texts, at least in ancient times. I'm not aware. So, there's another connection. The Pharisees, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes refer to the Pharisees as seekers after smooth things. Another translation of this idea is seekers after easy answers, or basically they want to find souls, make it easy. Uh, the New Testament has a similar condemnation of the Pharisees, uh, basically rending asunder the tradition, uh, rending asunder the commandments of, of God, of the law, by introducing their own traditions, and their own traditions was to make it easy for them. For instance, the law of Corbin, that we remember. They used this law, their, their own interpretation, to justify not taking care of their parents. So this is an example of them seeking after smooth things. And we see so many instances of the Messiah condemning the Pharisees with woes of condemnation. Now, there's a designation of a group. Uh, it both, this occurs in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the New Testament writings, but in no other source, no other group. And this designation is called the Way. The Dead Sea Scroll writers refer to themselves as the Way. And it comes from apocryphal texts. That, that they derived this phrase. The New Testament writers also, in the book of Acts, refer to themselves as the way, as an official title. It wasn't just a, a word, but it was actually, they used it as a self-designation. So no other Jewish groups used it like this, but the 
the Jewish Christians, so the Nazarenes, and the Essenes both use this phrase of themselves. Another example, which I'm not going to get into because it would have required me to do a lot more time of study, a compilation of this, but basically, if you do the research, you'll see many of the same uh, passages of quotations are proof texts, uh, the same proof texts that the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scroll writers used. So, for instance, quoting the same general messianic prophecies or quoting the same passages and having the same messianic interpretation to it. So, passages in the Law of Moses, like the blessing for Judah, both the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament interpret that as messianic. Also, the the new pro, uh, the prophet like Moses from Deuteronomy. That was interpreted both by the Dead Sea Scroll writers and the New Testament as a messianic prophecy. And prophecies from Isaiah and prophecies from King David in the Psalms, both of these were interpreted by the Dead Sea Scroll writers and the New Testament as messianic. Um, also, a similar method is used. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they use pe the Pesher method, it's called. It's an inspired interpretation of passages of prophecy which on the surface appear to have nothing to do with what their interpretation is, literal meaning. So, for instance, we're well aware of Matthew quoting uh, from the book of Isaiah about the virgin birth and applying it to the Messiah. Well, the problem is the original context was not referring to the Messiah, it was referring to something that was to be fulfilled in Isaiah's day. This happens all throughout in prophecies. Uh, the Old Testament prophesizes something literally, and then the New Testament writers impose it and make it fit to a, a, an event that happened with Yeshua, focusing it on Yeshua, the Messiah. Well, what we see with the Dead Sea Scrolls is something almost identical. They use it in the Pesher Method, it's called the Pesher Method, they do the same exact thing, but they apply it to their teacher of righteousness, and who was a messianic figure in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they're both applying basically the same general types of texts using the same type of style uh, of interpretation. So this is striking agreement here because no other group, Jewish group, used this type of method of interpretation of scripture. It was very unique. Uh, so also, the Dead Sea Scroll writers emphasized communion with angels. They are in unity with angels. And they had a striking angelology and demonology that just does not really have any context in the Old Testament much at all. They also had extra names of archangels. When you look in the New Testament, we see a reference to the archangel Gabriel. Well, hold on a second. Where did this Gabriel come from? Gabriel is not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament that we have. And yet, here he comes out of nowhere. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls and various apocryphal texts refer to the Archangel Gabriel and other archangels as well. And the New Testament is very strong on a type of angelology and demonology which is nowhere hinted at in the Old Testament. Just go through the Gospels and look at how the demons work. First of all, there's not really any mention of demons in the Old Testament at all. And this advanced type of demonology just is unparalleled in the Old Testament. It is paralleled in these Essene writings and Apocrypha writings. Uh, and something significant as well is that we are told that by Josephus that the Essenes preserved the names of angels, as especially they, re they revered the, the names of angels. Well, in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, they're one of the only churches that reveres the name of angels. They have like festivals for various angels. Um, and so... It's just striking uh, connection right there. And also, in Dead Sea Scrolls, we see something called the tongues of angels. Well, this is a familiar phrase in the New Testament. Paul refers to the tongues of, of angels. So there's another connection. Now, the apocalyptic genre and prophets in general. The Old Testament is almost completely void of any apocalypse or revelation type of prophecy. And yet the Apocrypha is full of it, and the Essene writings especially, the Dead Sea Scrolls, are very strikingly apocalyptic. In contrast, the Rabbinic writings tended to stay away from apocalyptic most of the time. 
uh, their Bible did not really have too much any apocalyptic writings. So basically all the extra apocalypses that were written down, they did not accept it as authoritative. But in contrast, the New Testament writers and the Dead Sea Scrolls were very emphasizing of apocalyptic literature. And, and the, uh, the prophet, basically the, the New Testament writers considered themselves to be prophets. And so did the Dead Sea Scroll writers. They considered themselves to be prophets. The Pharisees believed the gift of prophecy had passed away because they didn't have the prophecy anymore. They didn't have the ability to prophesy. There's no record of Pharisees, as far as I'm aware of, after the time of Nehemiah. No record of any Pharisees having the ability to prophesy. There are some legendary accounts, uh, but there's no, there's no reliable accounts of Pharisees having the ability to have, uh, of being prophets, um, that I'm aware of, anyways. So, but both the Essene writers and the New Testament writers are very strikingly prophetic. Uh, they consider themselves prophets, and that they're, they're the continuation of the Old Testament prophets. And another thing, too, is that the Dead Sea Scroll writers and New Testament Apocrypha literature elevate the priesthood way above the kingdom and the rabbis, whereas the rabbinic Jews tended to downplay the priesthood and they elevated the rabbis or the kingdom. So that's the ex an exact different difference between them. Uh, another thing is Belial and Satan. The concept of the wicked one, Belial, is very rare in early Pharisaic Judaism. But it's very prominent in Christianity, uh, Nazarene, and the Essene religion. In fact, the Satan concept is so foreign to the Pharisaic group, the rabbis, that many of the Jews do not even believe that Satan is an actual individual or being. It's just a, an angel that's an opposing, opposing being, not an actually evil, wicked individual. But yeah, as I said, the New Testament writers, Apocrypha writings, and the Dead Sea Scroll writings beg to differ. They believe there was a very powerful presence that was a prince of demons, and this was considered Belial. That they, both the New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls use this title, Belial. Uh, also, chronology differences. There are some striking differences in chronology between what we see in the New Testament and the Pharisees and their chronological differences often agree with the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls have many differences of chronology that are at wide variance with what the Pharisees taught for chronology. One, just one striking example is the Pharisees believe that the son of Arphaxad, so Shem was the son of Noah, and Arphaxad was the son of Shem. Well, the Pharisees believe that Arphaxad had a son named Selah, but the Dead Sea Scroll writers in the New Testament writers in the Gospel of Luke believed that the son of our, our Faxad was actually someone else named Canaan, and Canaan was the father of Selah, or Shiva. So that's just one example of many differences of chronology between the New Testament writers, Dead Sea Scrolls, and the, the rabbis. Another striking difference is David and Daniel. The rabbis, the Pharisees, classify David and Daniel as amongst the writings. There's the Tanakh, which is the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. They classify David and Daniel amongst the writings. However, the Dead Sea Scroll writers and the New Testament writers both refer to David and Daniel as prophets. And this is unprecedented in rabbinic Judaism. They don't really refer to them much at all, David and Daniel, as prophets. Now, there's this term in the Dead Sea Scrolls, a Hebrew word called serek, which the basic translation is rule or canon. And in the Ethiopian books of the New Testament, their extra books, they use this term of canon or rule many times in a very similar way that the, the Dead Sea Scroll writers used it for their own laws. Now, so I'll get more into that later, but so the, the works of the law, this phrase works of the law does not occur in any other literature as far as we, as we are aware of in ancient literature, uh, Jewish, of, except 
the New Testament, in Paul's writings, and uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The connection is very strong between the two. That it's, it supports the link between the, the, the scenes in the New Testament. Paul was saying that we are not saved by the works of the law. And yet Paul also taught elsewhere that we, it is not the hearers of the law who are justified, but it is the doers of the law who are justified. Similarly, the Essenes taught we must obey the law. But yet in other places, they say almost identical language with what Paul said. First of all, they said Abraham was justified by faith. And then somewhere else they say, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, they say that it is only by the grace of God that people are justified. It's only by, I think it even says grace alone, grace alone that we're justified. Uh, so the Dead Sea Scroll writers seem to almost have a similar idea with what Paul was saying, the requirement to obey the law, but it is not the works of the law itself which are the justification for you. It is the atonement that comes from God's mercy and forgiveness to you that is your source of salvation. Uh, also, in the Dead Sea Scroll writings, in the New Testament writings, it's unparalleled in any other writings except for the New Testament Apocrypha. But basically, uh, they, the New Testament writers refer to the church as a spiritual temple and a spiritual plantation. Similarly, the Dead Sea Scrolls say the same thing about the community or the Yahad. They describe themselves as, the, as a spiritual temple. So this is striking because we don't see this really anywhere in other literature. Both the New Testament and Dead Sea Scrolls use the phrase sons of light and sons of darkness to describe the, the righteous and the wicked. No other literature uses this. No other Jewish literature uses it, but the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament, primarily Paul, but also John. We see this dualism between light and darkness in the letters of John and in the Gospel of John. Uh, so the connection there is very striking. Also, the New Testament writers emphasize the New Covenant, and in the New Covenant was chiefly one of repentance. The, the Gospel was repent so that you may be saved. That's the New Covenant that they were preaching. And the Essenes taught the same exact thing in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They taught, they used the phrase, New Covenant, and they taught it was a covenant of repentance. So both of these groups are teaching a New Covenant, and this concept of New Covenant has come it does not exist in Pharisee Judaism. They, they didn't really ever emphasize a New Covenant uh, at all. They didn't really have a conception of that, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so, now also, I'm going to read, the, now I'm going to start reading some things, uh, some passages, which will, uh, the, the stuff I covered already was just very vague and general. You can, and so for those who are interested in more about those connections, you can message me or we can do uh, future studies on that. But then the, the things that follow are going to be more in-depth, uh, citing citation, quotations, so, so here we have in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, For he himself is our peace, who has both won and broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two. Um, I'm just going to stop reading there. Okay, so in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see something similar. Basically, we see that, uh, and during all these years, Belial shall be let loose against Israel, as God spake through Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, saying, Fear in the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitants of the land. This means the three nets of Belial, concerning which Levi, the son of Jacob, uh, by which he caught Israel and directed their faces to three kinds of righteousness. The first is fornication. The second is the wealth. The third is the pollution of the sanctuary. He that cometh up from this shall be caught by that, and he that escapeth from this shall be caught by that. The builders of the wall, who walk after law, the law it is which talks, of which he said, assuredly, they shall talk, are caught by fornication, taking two wives during their lifetime. But the fundamental principle of the creation, male and female, created he them. And they who went into the ark, two and two went into the ark. So both of these quotations I just mentioned basically refer to a middle wall of separation that was torn down. And what 
was the characteristic of this middle wall. It was basically commandments that uh, produced enmity. As Paul says, uh, abolishing his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Similarly, the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to these the law of which it is that talks. This is a, a way of saying the oral law. The Pharisees referred to the oral law uh, as authoritative. It was their rabbinic traditions, which had no scriptural basis, uh, but it was just their interpretation. Generally, very, very unfounded interpretations. And these interpretations are classified in the Dead Sea Scrolls as a wall. Uh, so the connection in the language there is striking. One of our best, well, Josephus was one of our best sources before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered of what the Essenes believed. Josephus wrote in depth on their beliefs. Here's one belief in particular, is predestination. Here's what we see, we're told by Josephus. He says, at this time there were three sixth, sects among the Jews who had different opinions concerning human actions. The one was called the sect of the Pharisees, another the sect of the Sadducees, and the other the sect of the Essenes. Now for the Pharisees, they say that some actions, but not all, are the work of fate. And some of them are in our own power, and that they are liable to fate, but are not caused by fate. But the sect of the Essenes affirm that fate governs all things, and that nothing befalls men but what is according to its determination. And for the Sadducees, they take away fate and say there is no such thing. And so Romans chapter 9 says a very similar thing. We see here, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will a thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Um, so that's pretty clear. There are very strong predestination. We see that also as Josephus describes of the Essenes, where the Essenes taught and believed that everything is predestined by fate. But at the same time, one sorry, at the same time, the both Paul and the Jesuit writers seem also to believe in free will. So they taught total predestination, but also free will. And that, as many believe, is a paradox, but there are various philosophical ways of resolving that apparent paradox. Uh, so both the Essenes and Paul and other writings of the Apocrypha support a extreme predestination of all things. Now, immortality of the soul and punishment of the wicked. I'm just going to refer you to Luke chapter 16. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Many dismiss it as a parable, a parable, but the problem is this description in Luke chapter 16 is almost identical with what Enoch says. Uh, so where did Enoch get this? Did he just make it up out of nowhere? Because how could he do that? And the why, why would Messiah use this phrase if, or this image if he knew that Enoch or the writer who claims to be Enoch made it up out of nowhere? He wouldn't, Messiah, Yeshua, would not want us to be led astray. So using this parable, to, if he did not believe there was an afterlife like that, would be very deceptive and obfuscating. So, uh, but so Enoch, chapter 22, I'm going to read, it's a, it says this. It says, and there, uh, excuse me, and thence I went to another place, and he showed me in the west another great and high mountain and a part and there was in it four hollow places, deep and wide and very smooth. How smooth are the hollow places and deep and dark to look at? Then Raphael answered one of the holy angels who was with me and said unto me, These hollow places 
have been created for this very purpose, that the spirits of the souls of the dead should assemble therein, yea, that all the souls of the children of men should assemble here. And these places have been made to receive them till the day of their judgment, until their appointed period, till the period appointed, till the great judgment comes upon them. I saw the spirits of the children of men who were dead, and their voice went forth to heaven and made suit. Then I asked Raphael, the angel who was with me, and I said unto him, This spirit, whose is it, whose go voice goeth forth and maketh suit? And he answered me, saying, This is the spirit which went forth from Abel, whom his brother Cain slew. And he makes his suit against him till his seed is destroyed from the face of the earth, and his seed is annihilated from amongst the seed of men. Then I asked regarding it and regarding all the hallow places, Why is one separated from the other? And he answered me and said unto me, These three have been made that the spirits of the dead might be separated, and such a division has been made for the spirits of the righteous, in which there is bright spring of water, and such has been made for sinners when they die and are buried in the earth, and judgment has not been executed on them in their lifetime. Here their spirits shall be set apart in this great pain, till a great day of judgment and punishment and torment of those who curse forever and retribution for their spirits. There he shall bind them forever, and such a division has been made for the spirits of those who make their suit who make disclosures concerning their destruction when they were slain in the days of the sinners. Such has been made for the sinners of men who were not righteous, but sinners who were complete in transgression, and of the transgressors they shall be companions. But their spirits shall not be slain in the day of judgment, nor shall they be raised from thence. And then I blessed the Lord of glory and said, Blessed be my Lord, the Lord of righteousness, who ruleth forever. So Enoch there seems pretty clear to not only be believing and teaching an afterlife, a conscious afterlife, where after you die, souls of both wicked and the righteous go, show. But also, as Enoch said, on the day of judgment, their spirits will not be slain, and they will not raise from this place of punishment, Enoch said. So he seems to believe in an eternal or everlasting punishment for the unsaved, for the wicked. Mark chapter 9, verses 42 to 48 Say a very, seem to say a very similar thing. Basically, the Messiah said, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So he mentioned, he repeats this image three times. Now, it's possible because some New Testament manuscripts, um, yeah, that's what uh, Jackson was saying, it's possible uh, that these are interpolations, not originally in the manuscripts, uh, the original. But the manuscripts, as uh, the, these particular manuscripts, have it mentioned three times. If he did indeed repeat it three times like this, then that is a, a very, a very striking, uh, a very striking presentation. Because to mention it three times would be basically saying, "Okay, I'm trying to get this through to your guys' head." Um, this is serious. Um, but so if it was only one time, it's still a very a very powerful image or basically saying it is better for this person to be killed than for cause, to cause someone to stumble, implying that there is a punishment after death. That's not just death, non-existence, but a punishment, uh, pain. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense for him to say it is better for him to die than to die. It wouldn't make sense because it's the same end result. Um, and also, we know, Revelation, uh, all the wicked are described with, with Satan and his angels being thrown into the lake of fire. And then the torment is described in a way that implies, seems to indicate a everlasting. And um, so Enoch and many other apocryphal texts emphasize a punishment after death and an everlasting one. Daniel, chapter 12, he describes a resurrection, people resurrecting from the dead to everlasting life and everlasting punishment. Now, some people believe in annihilationism, where spirits just cease to exist, and that's their everlasting punishment. But if that was the punishment, 
why would they be raised from the dead only to be annihilated once again? And it would not make sense. So it has to be something else other than annihilation for those group of people that are raised from the dead and then given everlasting punishment. Also, the Torah teaches an eye for an eye justice. If all the unsaved are given the same punishment of non-existence, that is not eye for eye justice. We are taught in the New Testament that each person who is, is unsaved will have differences of punishment. There, there are places in the New Testament where it says that, that there are different degrees of punishment. There will not be different degrees if they all have the same punishment of non-existence. Uh, so also, we see in the New Testament about Judas, Messiah said, whoa, it would be good if that man had never been born. Whoa. So what? If, if he's going to just die anyways and cease to exist, and that's his punishment, not being born ever would be the same thing. So there's no woe here because in either case, the end result would have been for him to not exist. Uh, Enoch said something similar, which probably is where Messiah got this idea. Basically, Enoch says, where then will be the dwelling of the sinners and where the resting place of those who have denied the Lord of Spirits? It had been good for them if they had not been born. So when he says, where then will be the dwelling of the sinners and the, where the resting place is, he's implying that there will be a dwelling and a resting place, but that it will be a place where they cannot rest and that their dwelling is not a place of, of comfort, but it is, it is a woe. It had been good for them if they had not been born. Uh, so, the, there was a church father, Hippolytus, um, he described the Essenes, and one of the things he described them as, he said, some, some Essenes call no one Lord except the deity, even though one should put them to the torture or even kill them. In the New Testament, we see something similar, call no man uh, teacher, call no man father, this type of concept. Of So the Essenes had a similar source right here. Well, another thing, though, in the very next, we see, uh, we see Josephus say, um, and they cherish respect for their elders and honor them and care for them just as parents are honored and cared for, their, uh, for by their lawful children, being supported by them in all abundance, both by their personal exertions and by innumerable contrivances. So this suggests that the Essenes understood that someone could be a father to someone else in, in one sense and not in another. So for instance, we all have fathers, literal fathers. It's okay to call them fathers. So the Essenes believed it was okay to call some individuals fathers. But as a title, the New Testament says uh, we're not to call someone by the title of father. So the Catholic priests basically have a title, father so-and-so. But they're not our father. They're not our spiritual parent who oversees us. So by us calling them father, we are giving them a, we're basically lying because they're not truly our spiritual father. And similarly, if we, just, if we call someone a doctor who's not our doctor, then we're, we are, that, that's the same as rabbi. So calling someone doctor so-and-so who has a degree, who got a degree in uh, education, with their little title of doctor, we're not supposed to call them by that name because unless they're our actual teacher. If they're not our teacher, then it's wrong for us to call them our teacher when they're not, in fact, our teacher. That's what the Messiah seems to ta have taught and the Apostle, uh, excuse me, the Essenes seem to have agreed. Um, let's see here. Hippolytus says this about the Essenes. Now, Hippolytus considered the Essenes to be heretics, okay? So this is it a unbiased in that sense because he did not have an interest in supporting the Essenes. So he says here, first, uh, th these are oaths that the Essenes were to take, okay, so uh, to become Essenes, people who are proselytes. So he says, first, that he will worship the divinity, next, that he will observe just dealings with men, and that he will in no way injure anyone, and that he will not hate a person who injures him or is hostile to him, but pray for them. So praying for enemies, this does not occur in Pharisaic writings, but it does occur in the New Testament. And so we see that it's attributed the same thing to the, the Essenes. Now, the, we see Josephus say, 
um, not only is Josephus, I think it's Philo, uh, among those men, you scenes, you will find no makers of arrows or weapons or swords or helmets or breastplates or shields, no makers of arms or of military engines, no one in short attending to any employment whatever connected with war, or even to any of those occupations, even in peace, which are easily perverted to wicked purposes, for they are utterly ignorant of all traffic and of all commercial dealings and of all navigation, but they repudiate and keep aloof from everything which can possibly afford any inducement to covetousness. In the Ethiopian New Testament that I mentioned, one of their books, actually it's several books that say this, but I'm only going to quote one of, one of the books that says this. It says, and a proselyte or believer, if they wish to be a soldier, shall be rejected because it is far from God. What does that mean, shall be rejected? In the context of the passage, they're referring to the church. Someone who wants to join the church. If they are a proselyte or believer, if they wish to be a soldier, they shall be rejected from the church because it is far from God. So we see here the apostles are condemning basically a secular army. We're not to be part of the army of the pagans. So the Essenes, as well as the, this book claiming to be by the apostles, forbids being involved in pagan wars. Um, so, so Pliny describes the Essenes in this manner. He says this about the Essenes. On the west side of the Dead Sea, but out of range of the noxious exhalations of the coast, is the solitary tribe of the Essenes which is remarkable beyond all the other tribes in the whole world, as it has no woman and has renounced all sexual desire, has no money, and has only palm trees for company. Day by day, the throng of refugees is recruited to an equal number by numerous accessions of persons tired of life and driven thither by the waves of fortune to adopt their manners. So, um, and the, ge ge the geography of what Pliny says about the Essenes it's exactly the, ge the geography of where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. So there's a striking confirmation that the Dead Sea Scroll writers were Essenes. Josephus says, um, hold on a sec. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read this part of Josephus. I'm going to go on to something else. Okay, so now I'm going to get to the parts which are really impressive, which is... Uh, the basically showing agreements, striking agreements between what's distributed to the Essenes by the various sources we have, like Josephus, Philo, Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Apocrypha and New Testament. Okay, so here we're starting with mandatory communism. Communism is one of the most controversial things for a modern society, especially a capitalistic society, which believes that everyone has a right to personal ownership and private property. But the Essenes believe differently, and the the apostles according to these other books, and even some of the New Testament itself and the Messiah, seem to actually agree with the Essenes that communism is the way to go. So I'm going to read some of these passages, which are very striking. So I'm going to skip one, one of these quotations, because it's often repetitive, so I don't need to quote all of these things. So Josephus says, These men, the Essenes, are despisers of riches, and so very communicative, in other words, communistic, as raises our admiration. Nor is there anyone to be found among them who hath more than another, for it is a law among them, so it's not just a suggestion, but he says it's a law among them, that those who come to them must let what they have be common to the whole order, insomuch that among them all there is no appearance of poverty or excess of riches, but everyone's possessions are intermingled with everyone uh, of every other's possessions, and so there is, as it were, one patrimony among all the brethren. Philo says the same thing about the Essenes in, in greater detail. Here's what we see on the New Testament. The book of Acts, we see this. In chapter 2, we see verses 42 to 47. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Acts 4, we see, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, 
But they had all things in common, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great graces upon them all. Nor were there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possession who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. In the very next chapter, we see this little incident where two of the individuals lie about their money. And this is considered a serious transgression of, of lying and holding back some of the money from the community. So serious that Peter has them killed. He has uh, the angel... Uh, kill the the two people, the, the husband and wife. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see the same emphasis that of what happened in chapter 5 of this is a serious sin, and if someone does this, they must be punished severely for it. So both the New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls basically say it's a sin to lie to the community about the money that you gave, that you gave to them, uh, basically lying about how much you gave to them. Uh, we don't see this idea anywhere else in any other sources, but we see them in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament. The, the Constitutions of the Apostles, which is in the Ethiopian New Testament, claims to be by the Apostles, says this, If you have by the work of your hands, give, that you may labor for the redemption of your sins. For by alms and acts of faith, sins are purged away. You shall not grudge to give to the poor, nor when you have given shall you murmur. For you shall know who will repay you your reward. For says he, he that has mercy on the poor man lends to the Lord according to his gift. So shall it be repaid him again. You shall not turn away from him that is needy. For says he, he that stops his ear not hear the cry of the needy himself also shall call and there shall be to hear him. You shall communicate in all things to your brother and shall not say your goods are your own. For the common participation of the necessaries of life is appointed to all men by God. So this apostolic constitution is saying the common participation of the necessaries of life is appointed to all men by God. So they're not to call anything their own, but they're communicating all things to your brother. That's a striking agreement with what we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So whoever wrote the apostolic constitution seemed to have some in a seen influence. We also see in the Epistle of Barnabas, the writer says, Thou shalt communicate in all things with thy neighbor. Thou shalt not call things thine own. For if you are partakers in common of things which are incorruptible, how much more of those things which are corruptible? Here's another quotation. This is from the homilies of Clement. Uh, this says, this claims to be by Clement, the disciple of Peter himself. And so he says this, Will you be so good as to explain this matter also? I remember Clement saying to me that we suffer injuries and afflictions for the forgiveness of our sins. Peter said, This is quite correct, for we who have chosen the future things, insofar as we possess more goods than these, whether they be clothing or food or drink or any other thing, possess sins, because we ought not to have anything, as I explained to you a little ago. To all of us, possessions are sins. The, depri the deprivation of these, in whatever way it may take place, is the removal of sins. Uh, and he says, see, and Peter said, most justly, for since the boundary line of the saved is, as I said, that no one should possess anything, but since many have many possessions, or in other words, sins, for this reason, the exceeding sins, afflictions on those who do not act in purity of heart, that on account of their having some measure of the love of God, they might, by temporary afflictions, inflictions, be saved from eternal punishment. So this writer is claiming to be the companion of Peter, and he attributes to Peter the teaching that private property, possessions, is a sin. So all your possessions are to be in common with everyone of the of your community, your religious brothers. This agrees with the Essenes. Uh, so that's another connection. Now we'll go to the New Testament as we have it to show that the New Testament says similar things too. We see Matthew 19. Now behold, one came and said to him, The good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me the good? No one is the good but one, that is God. 
But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Luke's version is basically similar, but he adds this. He says, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And he, uh, he says, yeah, so sell all that you have. Uh, the other one doesn't say that exactly like that. Um, and then here is in Luke chapter 6, we see verses, uh, we see, then he lifted up his eyes toward the disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So he's emphasizing here the rich who have possessions of their own, which are not being ashamed for poor, are in fact going to receive a woe, because they have already received their consolation. Here's another striking example. We see Josephus says this about the Essenes. He says, Nor do they allow of the change of uh, shoes or garments to be first torn to pieces or worn out by time. He also says, they have no one certain city, but many of them dwell in every city, and if any of their sect come from other places, what they have lies open for them, just as if it were their own. And they go into such as they never knew before, as if they had been ever so long acquainted with them, for which reason they carry nothing at all with them when they travel into remote parts, though Still, they take their weapons with them for fear of thieves. So here we see in the Gospels, we see this. Luke 3, verse 11. He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. That was from John the Baptist. Matthew 10. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter into a city of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. And in Luke 9, verse 3, And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. That's just a striking agreement with what Josephus said about the Essenes. Um, and he said, Luke 10, the Messiah said the same thing to the 70 apostles. He says, carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. Mark 6, uh, 6 verse 8 and verse 9. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Now, also we see, in Acts of John, we see this. And Secundus, the bathkeeper, answered and said to the holy man, or to John, I wish to know what thou dost with thy wages. For lo, all these days thou hast not bought for thyself either shoe or coat. Tell me, if it be enough, and if not, deposit thy wages in my hands, and I will buy for thee whatever thou requirest, for thou art a stranger, and hast no kindred here. But John said to Secundus, ye bathkeeper, I have a master, and he has ordered me and the disciples, my fellows, that none should possess gold or silver or brass in a purse or two coats, and I cannot despise his command, otherwise he would be wroth with me. So the Acts of John also confirms this idea. Now, Josephus says something else about the Essenes. He says this, they have stewards appointed to take care of their common affairs, who every one of them have no separate business for any, but what is for the uses of them all. Stewards appointed, there are stewards appointed to take care of the common affairs, so, and um, one appointed to take care of strangers and provide garments and other needs. 
And accordingly, let's see. Yeah, so accordingly, there is in every city where they live one appointed particularly to take care of strangers and to provide garments and other necessaries for them. That's what Josephus said. Now, the writings of the New Testament Apocrypha in the Ethiopian New Testament Bible says the same exact things. And they say, here, here's just one quotation, distribution of goods by bishop to those in need. It says, we command that the bishop have power over the goods of the church. But if he be entrusted with the precious souls of men, much more ought he to give directions about goods, that they all be distributed to those in want according to his authority by the presbyters and deacons and be used for their support with fear of God and with all reverence. And so we also see this. Josephus says this, And truly as for other things, they do nothing but according to the injunctions of their curators or overseers. Only these two things are done among them at everyone's own free will, which are to assist those that want it and to show mercy, for they are permitted of their own accord to afford succor to such as deserve it when they stand in need of it and to bestow food on those that are in distress, but they cannot give anything to their kindred without the curators or overseers. So here, basically, Josephus says the Essenes believed that the overseers were like basically a totalitarian authority over the members, except over those two things of helping those in need um, and giving mer being merciful to others. And so where did this idea of bishop come from? Where in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see this exact thing. So nowhere else does the concept of bishop occur in Jewish writings, but it occurs in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they have this overseer they refer to. And the, the New Testament has these bishops coming out of nowhere. Well, the context is supported by the, the New Testament of the Ethiopians, where the, the Messiah and the Apostles introduced the commandments uh, as being required for all believers of the bishop. But this bishop is not a new commandment, it's a, it's a slight reformation of what the Essenes were already doing. So there is actually not very much of a difference at all between the bishops of the New Testament and the New Testament Apocrypha and the Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls. What's well, attributed to both their roles, the characteristics of what they're supposed to be doing for the congregation are almost identical. Uh, both were considered priests with authority over the people. So um, Ignatius, uh, early church father writer, he is a close source to the apostles. He actually met some of the apostles himself. And Ignatius, he says a very similar thing. Basically, he says he like elevates the level of bishop so much that basically all the laity or the members of the regular people are supposed to adhere to the bishops, the overseers, as a complete authority. This is just an exact agreement with what the Essenes say about the bishops having supreme authority over the congregation. And so this idea of bishop is just supported so much in the apocryphal literature as well as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Also striking is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the bishop is required to be from the ages of 30 to 50. He has to be ordained from the years of 30 years of age to the 50 years of age. We see this in one of the Apocrypha books, the same thing in the New Testament uh, Bible. They say the bishop is to, be, is to be up to 50 years and also as young as middle age. Now, what does the Torah say middle ages? The Torah says when you're 60 years old, you become an old person. So middle age would be 30 years. So here, this apocryphal text in the Ethiopian Bible agrees with the Dead Sea Scrolls in saying the bishop is to be from the years of 30 and 50. A striking agreement there. But the, the New Testament writers of the Ethiopian Bible also say that if, however, there's no one available between those years and you have no one else, then in that time it's an emergency and you can use someone who is younger or presumably older. Uh, so now we are also told in the Dead Sea Scrolls of a council of the twelve and a community of three uh, priests. Well, this idea is strikingly similar to what we see in the New Testament when Messiah takes twelve apostles and three of there was like a, a group of three that was Peter, John, and James. So this the numbers thing that the Messiah was doing was very similar to what the Dead Sea Scrolls have. Now in the Dead Sea Scrolls we see something referred to as the many. The many actually have like an authority. It's a, it's a term, a description, 
in Dead Sea Scrolls of a committee, which is the entire community, which is referred to as the many. We don't see this concept of the many in pretty much any other writings, but we do see it in the New Testament by Paul. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, chapter 2, he says, But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which is inflicted by the majority, or the many, is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Uh, so this is, again, both of them are teaching this content of the, the many, the majority, but we don't see this in other literature. And the Dead sea, the Josephus says that, uh, he says, in the judgments they exercise, they are most accurate and just, nor do they pass sentence by the votes of a court that is fewer than a hundred. And as, um, as to what is once determined by that number, it is unalterable. Now we see in the New Testament, we see the 12 apostles, and we also see 72, we see 72 apostles picked by the Messiah. We see the high priest that he picks, James. And uh, he, the Messiah, basically claims himself to be king. The reason we know this is because in the Sea Scrolls, the, there's a, a copy of the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy, which is much longer and much fuller. And in this version, which the evidence seems to support, to support that it's the original version, it commands the king to have 12 Israelites always by his side, 12 priests and 12 Levites, so for a total, total of 36. So basically, when the Messiah picked 12 apostles, he was basically claiming himself to be king in a subtle way. And so when you do all the math, so you see the king, the Messiah, the 12 apostles, and then the, the 12 Levites, the 12 priests, then the 72, which the Law of Moses refers to as the Sanhedrin, the 72 apostles, and then the high priest would be James, all together that's 100. Uh, so this 100, 100 number is both in the New Testament writers as well in Dead Sea Scrolls and the Essenes. Um, see here. Okay, so, let's see, one second. Okay, so now we're going to get some, some more very intriguing stuff here. So, Council of the Ten. Josephus says this, Accordingly, if ten of them be sitting together, no one of them will speak while the other nine are against it. Remember I told you about the Revelation of Peter, which has not been translated fully into English yet? Well, this particular passage is a little uncertain to me, because I tried to translate it. Uh, I didn't do a, an official translation. It was only a, a quick one. So I might be misunderstanding it, but the way it reads in what the translation I have here seems to say the same thing about the ten men. So it says, So you have the church, so that the Lord will dwell in it with all of you. Here is a comparison. A rich man has built a house all decorated and bright. He built seven columns, and the seventh is the very basis. Its lock, as befits his goalkeeper and suitable. He created it in six counselors. The seventh he has placed above them, that gives orders to all. He has created two inspectors to oversee the good and the bad. Beneath them, he has created two carriers, leading everything. He appointed ten men among them, whose control for everything that he wanted them to make his will. So our first ten men who had like a special authority. It's possible I've mistranslated some of this, but the way this translation is right now seems to support that the, the Ethiopian New Testament had the same teaching of ten men sitting together and having an authority. The Dead Sea Scrolls confirm what Josephus says of them. Now, Josephus says this of the Essenes. He says this, But now if anyone hath a mind to come over to their sect, he is not immediately admitted, but he is prescribed the same method of living, which they use for a year, while he continues excluded. And they give him also a small hatchet, and the aforementioned girdle, and a white garment. And when he hath given evidence during that time that he can observe their continence, he approaches nearer to their way of living, and is made a partaker of the waters of purification. Yet he is not even now admitted to live with them, for after this demonstration of his fortitude, his temper is tried two more years, and if he appear to be worthy, then they admit him into their society. So Josephus said there's a three-year conversion process to become an Essene. 
Here are three quotations from the New Testament of the Ethiopians, which say the same thing. We see this. In the Synodos, we see this. Let him who is to be a proselyte be a proselyte for three years. But if anyone be diligent and has a good will to his business, let him be admitted. For it is not the length of time, but the course of life that is judged. So they say three years, unless he very well succeeding in his learning, and then he can bring it, be brought in sooner. So the three years is the default, and there's exceptions. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to finish this section, and then we'll probably have to end it here. Part two will be tomorrow, and this will cover the rest, because it's, it is very compelling, the rest I have to share with you, especially other quotations from the Revelation of Peter. So here's another passage from uh, the same book of Sinodos. It says, And he who requests the believers in Christ that he may be in the number of those who do virtuously and devote themselves in quietness and purity, shall prove himself in virtue three years. If he was a man who has spiritual gift and goodness and purity, he shall be received, because this thing shall not be quickly in its time, but it shall be of good mind in devotion and prudence. And, um, and then for the, in the first book of the covenant, we see this. Uh, let him who is instructed with all care and hear the perfectness of the gospel be instructed not less than three years. And if he loving strive to be baptized, let him be baptized. But if he be quiet and meek and earnest and persevering and abiding with him who teacheth him with labor, with watching, with confession, with subjection, and with prayers, and he desire to be baptized sooner, let him be baptized. For it is not a time that is considered, but the will of faith. So I'm going to probably have to end it here for this time, but so I want to just give a, a basic uh, what you can expect in tomorrow's session. For I hope you, all of you who participate tonight will stay tuned for tomorrow for the, the finishing of this. But so basically, I'm going to discuss a little bit more about these three years uh, conversion process. There's some evidence possibly that the New Testament has a similar idea in our, in our New Testament. But so what I showed... What I quoted is striking agreement between the Essenes and the Apocrypha books of a three-year conversion process. No other Jewish group had this, but the Essenes and these, these Apocrypha writings in the Ethiopian Bible have this. So I'm going to finish up the three years section uh, tomorrow, and also to give you an overview of what will be coming up next for tomorrow's the completion of this. Uh, I'm going to be discussing the their the preference for celibacy, showing how the New Testament, basically everything that I'm about to say right now is showing how the New Testament writers or the Apocrypha New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls and Essenes say the same thing. So preference for celibacy, belief in sex for procreation only, and anti-pleasure. So they believed pleasure was basically bad if it was just pleasure for the sake of pleasure. Um, but marriage, not all marriage is bad though. Some marriage is, is okay, it's just that Celibacy is, is superior. Uh, and let's see, one second. Uh, I'm going to be discussing the, so virgins, uh, and then the divorce and polygamy. Going to show that they, their agreements on divorce and polygamy. And let's see here. Also, I'm going to touch on uh, their condemnation of certain incest which the Pharisees actually believed was not incest, but the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament writers did believe was incest. I'm going to discuss both their views on swearing, and we're going to discuss the lack of condemnation of the Essenes in all these other documents, including the New Testament. Uh, and I'm going to be discussing the procedures of, of, of their holy meal. Both groups had a holy meal. I'm going to be describing the relationships between that and see here. Another striking one is uh, their holy place. They both had a holy place, a sanctuary, laws for that, and excommunication. The process of excommunication in both are very strikingly similar. And passages, this will be really amazing, passages from the Revelation of Peter, which I mentioned, never before translated into English, but which are very pro-Torah, more than we've seen in anything else. And um, let's see... 
what else is left? Sacrifices. Their view on the on their own priesthood and their own sacrifices, showing the similarities between that and their calendar. So a peculiar calendar, which both of them observe, the same one. I'm going to show evidence for that. Extra feast days. They both taught extra holidays or feast days not in the Law of Moses of our copies. And their daily prayers. I'll be discussing their daily prayers and their their martyrdoms, their refusal to disobey the law to save life. So that's everything I hope to discuss, to discuss next time. So sorry we had to end it so prematurely today, but there was just so much to cover and I just couldn't finish it all. I couldn't fin it, fit it all in this one session. So I hope you stay tuned for tomorrow's. Thank you, Shalom. Awesome. Awesome. Glad you guys came. Thanks, Onehu. Yeah, hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope we it did. was uh, exciting. All right, I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. Try to rest okay. your brain tonight. <laughs> yeah, my eyes too. Okay. So.